Okay. There has been some uh, parameter changes uh, that the JC set, and they did tell us they were going to, but then I, we never got a follow-up saying what those changes would be. And you guys are the lucky, uh, uh, luckier of the two classes uh, among uh, this semester's, uh, my classes. Uh, students. Why do I say that? Because last night the class had to be canceled. And the reason for that was because I couldn't sign on to, uh, to a new meeting. It kept saying, join a meeting every time I tried to log on and start a new meeting. So like I just did for all you guys tonight, as it's worked for, you know, two semesters, suddenly in the middle of this semester, uh, they changed something and I didn't know about it. So I finally, my wife and I, it's mostly her, uh, tech savvy it helps to have someone in your house who is it took us an hour and a half to figure out what was wrong and you don't need to know the details but that obviously got fixed but then i didn't know until just now as i was trying to send you the info log on about this other uh, change so that there is no passcode now but the good news is all you need is the is the number so from now on it'll be easier and quicker for you to sign on Okay, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, your papers are due today. I uh, give people a break because I know a lot of people work until right up before class, or you have kids, or you know uh, other uh, obligations. So as long as I get them by midnight tonight, California time, uh, they won't be counted late. Uh, and no points off. After that, it's five points off, and when it's a week or more late, it doesn't go up beyond ten points off. But that is a whole letter grade, so you don't want that to happen. So hopefully, I saw I think a dozen papers that were turned in uh, by five p.m. But I haven't checked again. So now is a good time with questions. If you still, if you haven't put your paper in final form and you have questions, please do ask me now. Yeah, I have a question. Um, what? How should we? Like, should we email it to you or? Yeah. Yes, that's what I uh, was saying, and I did. Like, is it your email. AOL, AOL email? Yes, uh, AOL email, absolutely. And this is the format. Obviously, you guys are in Art One Point One, so I wrote down. You know, either I have you know, obviously another class One Point Two, but either way, you put the 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 class number, and obviously for you guys, it's already uh, clear. It should all be One Point One. And then short paper, number one, underline, last name, comma, first name. That way they get logged in properly and I can start working on grading the ones that I get. Oh, a couple more people want to join. Hang on. Um, well, I guess they're over here. Let's see. I think that's it. Yes. Okay, good. Welcome. Uh, we were just talking about making sure you says, uh, send your papers, email them to my AOL email. I've had more. You don't need to live in a better neighborhood. It, it meant the right to vote. It meant to enjoy uh -oh. countless social. <laughs> uh, some other kind of yes interference. Okay, starting over. Uh, yeah, if you send them to my uh, Outlook, they there's so much spam on there, and and it's so much harder to delete that spam than it is on AOL. At least from my years of experience with the two websites. So. So please send it to Mark W. And also it's easier for me to forward them. Uh, well, it's not easier, it's just slightly quicker uh, to those that I don't grade. So I'm gonna start dividing them up, even maybe right after class tonight to the ones that I'm gonna grade in this batch. And then I will of course switch off so that you can count on me at least personally grading at least one of your two papers and at least one of your two exams. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh it should be 23 typed lines, right? Yes, or, that's a full page. Or, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, be, to be safe, you're cutting it close. If you, you know, if you, if you give me 21 lines and then, you know, uh, you know, a, a URL for a website or something, I wouldn't probably take points off. But what, you, why don't you say 25 and then you're really safe? Because then there's no question. I won't even need to count or neither will the readers who grade the others. Uh, you know, once I, we glance at a page, we can pretty well tell if it's if it's borderline, we count the number of lines. And if it's under, we take off a, a few points. And it's, I, got, it's the fast I got confused way. with the- Sorry, please go ahead. The, I got confused with the, the ones that you sent because it says 20 points and then it says 23 type it, type it lines. Right, and then that's correct. Say, and yeah, that's points? the minimum. That, that'll that work. But why do the minimum? You're in college, right? I'm sorry, I'm being, okay. <laughs> I'm being a pest. 
it's better to not get just cut it to the very minimum if you can't do more than that you'll get full credit if you don't have more to okay. say but i bet everyone does you uh, hopefully okay, all of you take the work of art you care about you like your your passion so you could even add two more lines at the end about your opinion of it easy right then you know you're over the limit i'm just giving you a helpful suggestion to avoid being on the cusp between you know too short and long enough but but 23 is the minimum and anything that is 23 lines long in each remember both halves 23 lines for the meaning and 23 lines or more for the formal analysis but it usually takes people longer than that to do a good job but i've seen people get a's with just barely 46 lines total between the two halves and exactly 23 lines in each half that's that's rare, but uh, it can happen. So it's safer if you if you give yourself a little more time to give, add a couple sentences. You know, your opinion is valid as long as it's not all you're doing. Because of course the research paper, you've hopefully all done the research and you know your bibliography sources now. Uh, but then uh, at this point, oh yes, there is one more thing. I'm, I almost forgot. I held this up, but not very long. I did this before, so you should be able to see it on the recorded lectures from last week or the previous because we've been talking about the papers for a couple of weeks. Noodle tools at the SR, I didn't write SRJC library website, which you can all find on your own. It's pretty easy. Uh, that, that's actually a category underneath which you'll find a prompt for how to cite sources. That's one way among many to, to double check that you're citing your source in the bibliography at the end of your paper, which is just a list thoroughly describing, you know, the website, you know, and the date you accessed it right, for whatever research you did, if it's websites. I did tell people that you don't have to have a printed source that you physically handle. Of course, it's, we're in a pan pandemic. Uh, but, but you do need to try and find a source that was originally uh, published. And that should be easy. They're, this, they're all online now. I mean, every book I've ever either read or written, uh, the ones I've had myself written and had published, and all the ones that I've ever read, for I don't know, at least the last 15 years, are both available as eBooks. Well, most of them, anyway, if they're not, you know, Pulp Fiction or something. <clears throat> I'm not talking about the movie, I'm talking about cheap paperbacks might not be in ebook format, but anything you're gonna use for research should be in both. So it should wow. be easy to find. You know, in other words, don't only give me one website. You can use Wikipedia. I had this question come up just last night on a phone call with a student from India who, uh, Who's trying to be very thorough and it's a good thing because he's probably given himself a, a really good shot at an A now. I haven't seen his paper yet, but uh, because he wasn't sure whether he could just use w Wikipedia. That's all one source, one type of, you know, one specific website. So you can use Wikipedia, but at least one of the uh, three new sources should be a different source, whether it's a website, a different website, or preferably something that was once published or a museum brochure or a documentary. We covered all this before, so I shouldn't take too much more time because we do want to get to the slides of ancient Rome. I think you're going to find them interesting. But now is, is a perfectly good time to ask any questions about anything relating to the papers. Any other questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, on the, on the um, instructions, it says that the formal analysis should be around one and a half typed one to one and a half typed pages is yeah. that the maximum well, what one is the minimum is 23 lines like we were just saying you know mm -hmm. i mean that is the minimum for both halves however to do a good job i can tell you very few people get an a if they only give me 23 lines of formal analysis because you don't have the the length you know uh to Remember the rule for an A in that or full points in that part of your paper, which is worth a third, almost 30 points right out of 100, as you know, from looking at the cover sheet, right, uh, is to give me at least two examples of each of those nine elements. So when you start adding that up, you can see how that's almost impossible to do a thorough job, even to reach the minimum requirement of covering each of the nine elements uh, clearly and giving two examples of each one in less than about a page and a half, but some people can do that. It depends, you know, sometimes well, was, the work of art doesn't have some elements because it's a modern abstract painting or something, then that maybe makes it easier. Yes, please go ahead. I was just wondering if we were allowed to go above one and a half pages. Oh, yes, yes. Should... Please don't give okay. 10 or pages. <laughs> That's, uh, be kind to your teacher. Uh, is, I've had people do 14 and 15 page papers. 
this isn't graduate school, so you don't, yeah, that would be excessive, or even 10, uh, hopefully no more than seven total, including your bibliography, but some people get really into what they're writing and that's commendable. It won't, there'll be no points off if you go over the minimum, okay? It's only if you go under the minimum, then you have points off, of course. Okay, uh, again, this is the right time for now, although I'll stick around, I always do after class to answer any other remaining questions. It's not, not so much a question, but it looks like Chad is disabled. Oh, I didn't do that, uh-oh. I don't know why it would be. Uh, I, that's, you see why I like, I'm looking to see if there's anything, hang on, when it says more, sometimes there's a thing down here. I see what you're, yeah, let's check and see. Breakout, no, I don't want to do breakout rooms. No, that doesn't work with this kind of a lecture class. Um, sometimes at the top of the page, it'll give uh, alternatives to add, you know, I don't see any though right now. I tell you what, let me, let me. Um, I get out like. Yeah, I'm looking for that. Uh, let's yeah, see. like 8.50. Well, you have to go my to sleep screen, night, right? all I see is, of course. I, we can play tomorrow, okay? Yeah. Well, at this point, I think we're going to have to do for tonight. And I'll check on that. Although, good luck getting anyone to answer the phone at the tech services. First of all, they only open from 9 to 3. What good does that do when you're teaching after 3 o'clock? There are a lot of classes at the JC later than 3 after, in the afternoon. As they found out to my, you know, uh, uh, chagrin yesterday when I couldn't reach a live person uh, as my class was sitting there waiting to log on and I didn't, they didn't know I couldn't, you know. So once we solve that problem, I guess the others are minor, but I agree it would be helpful. I'm looking to see if there's, let's see, stop it. No, because um, I don't see, you know, I'll try it again, but down at the bottom, usually it's at the top where it says more options. See breakout rooms, that's all it's giving me. Uh, I'm gonna check on that. I'll see if I can get a live person. I'll call early enough that they'll be open to tell me what, if anything, there is I'm not seeing on my screen that would allow me to let you check. Cause it is a good function. I really want to, let's see. Um, maybe during the break, I can play around with it but we kind of got to keep moving. So at least you have all of you, obviously you can tell I didn't mute anybody. So you mute yourself, that's your choice. So for now, at least, verbally does anybody have any other questions about the papers okay so hopefully i will check actually i'll be up that late i always am uh right around midnight a little after to get the, all the papers that were turned in on time you know uh, distributed between me the readers and start you know the process of grading i cannot promise you they'll be returned to you two weeks from the day they were due that is my goal uh, but I prefer to have all the papers turned in on time. So this will be my last announcement before we start the lecture tonight. Uh, I, I don't think it's fair to some students to, oh, I got my paper back, you know, last week in two or three or four or five, or even a third of the class doesn't get theirs till a week later. So I wait till I get them all graded myself and logged in and double. And I do not blindly just uh, log in the grade of my readers when they send me the paper I check their work okay I want to make sure you know that everybody so it's it's thorough it's as thorough as it can be and then after they're all entered in the roll book is when I then uh, send you guys your grades you know and of course I may I'm not going to announce them on obviously on, on zoom uh, but but if you turned your paper in late it could be a, a few more days of course obviously I mean I, I put those in the to do later pile but mostly it's between two and at most three weeks after the the papers have been turned in that you will have gotten your grades now some people turn their papers in early so those i would then get back sooner there were maybe half a dozen that did that all right one more time any other questions okay we're going to talk about rome but before we get to the actual uh, slides for tonight Actually, we're going to start with the Etruscans, who were the forerunners of the Romans. They actually ruled Rome. Most people have never heard of them, unless you've been to Italy, or you have a lot of knowledge. But I'm going to hold this book up that I got for Christmas many years ago. Let's see if I can get the map. <laughs> Sorry. I to, yeah, get it close enough. <laughs> Sorry that you guys can see some hint of how big the Roman Empire was. It was about two and a half million square miles. Now, if you know some of you, <laughs> maybe a few of you, geography, the US is three and a half million square miles, so is China. 
right? Uh, so it might sound like, oh, what's a big deal? Was it even as big as our one country? Yeah, but back in the ancient world, that's a huge empire. More to the point, they ruled, the Romans ruled over, this is your context, which as I say, you could write notes about because it could be related to any of the slides from the Roman, which is the majority of tonight and uh, the first half of next week's topic. Of course, we're gonna review for the midterm next week too. So anyway, the point being that uh, the Romans ruled, there are two facts that might put in perspective and then we'll get to our first must know slide. They ruled over 50 different nations that they had conquered. That's a big empire in anybody, even today, that'd be a big empire when the world back then, of course, was way less populated. And then speaking of population, uh, demographers, historians who do, do calculations of populations from ancient times, there are ways to do that. Every, every kingdom had a tax and everybody in the kingdom was taxed and there are records of that in most parts of the world. So we can calculate roughly at the height of the Roman empire, which is about 200 AD before it started to decline, uh, there were about 450 million people on the planet Earth. That sounds like a, hard to believe, right? We have almost 8 million now. But anyway, so that wasn't even half a billion, right? That was an estimated population of the entire planet. The Romans ruled 220 million people. That's almost half the human race in one empire. That has never happened before or since. Larger geographically, physically larger empires like Genghis Khan, yeah, and uh, parts of the Chinese empire when they expanded in what we call the Middle Ages were, were physically bigger, but they didn't rule over that high a percentage of the, of the uh, population. But of course, population grew. And so by the Middle Ages, at least in other parts of the world, in Europe, it was stagnant because of the plagues, right? The Black Death. And, but in China and India, population kept growing. So they maybe the Chinese had as many as 300 million watts, well, what they estimate by, by the Middle Ages in their empire. But you have to do the context. You, oh, follow what I'm saying. So, if at the time the Roman Empire was at the height, its height of 200 years AD or, or CE, the entire world population, 450 million, nearly half, 220 million is almost half of the entire human race, was ruled by one empire. And that's rather in of itself a remarkable achievement. Uh, and of course they uh, had a lot of other achievements we're going to be seeing. So let's get to the screen sharing tonight. Okay. Uh, and we are gonna start with the first must know right off the bat. And I am going to now move this. Yeah, I wanna, let's see, it's hide, hide thumbnails. There we go. <laughs> so you guys can eat in peace. <laughs> okay, all right, now. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. And so you can see this slide, right? Okay. This is the first must know for tonight. And it's a very evocative work of art. And what I mean by that is that it, it has a very strong personal uh, effect on people. I've seen it. It's at the Louvre. You have to know that. It's, it's in Paris, actually. Uh, but the name of this is one word, sarcophagus. Or if you're from Indiana, as my favorite aunt used to mispronounce these foreign words, sarcophagus, she called it. Sarcophagus, I'll spell that once for you, is S-A-R-C-O-P-H-A-G-U-S, sarcophagus. The location is the city in Italy, but we give you the city because there are several burial sites for this culture, the Etruscans. We're going to talk about who they were now in just a minute, but let me spell the location, and that's uh, one word, C-E-R-V-E-T-E-R-I, Cerveteri. And the date is 520 B.C. or B.C.E. So let's start with <clears throat> uh, the terms to know. You should have always have that handout in front of you. Right at the top of the page for this week's lecture, the first term is sarcophagus. So it's a short definition. Here we go. I'll, I'll uh, say it slowly and repeat it once. The sarcophagus is a large stone or metal box containing the remains of a deceased human being, containing the remains of a deceased human being, comma, often with decorations on the outside, often with decorations on the outside, period. That's what this is. This is a sarcophagus. Anybody need me to repeat that definition? 
Everybody got that? Well, I'm not getting anybody saying they can't hear me. Okay, I hope or, or see the slide. So uh, I am assuming everybody. Yeah, is. I can hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it always helps to have confirmation before we proceed. All right. So who are the Etruscans? That's the main part of the meaning. Uh, well, one of the two main things about the meaning. The first is uh, the fact that they ruled Italy before the Roman Empire. And Rome began as one of their vassal. There's no other way to say it. V-A-S-S-A-L. You don't have to know that word or, or spell it right. Uh, but if this slide is on the exam, on, on the midterm, You'd want to use that word or something because it means, you know, uh, a, a small city or st a kingdom uh, under the rule of someone else. It wasn't a colony. You wouldn't use that word. That's a different idea. So just say, you know, the city of Rome was ruled by the Etruscans for its first 250 years. It was under Etruscan rule. And again, the Etruscans, I, I actually don't think I spell that word. So let me do that now. Uh, e, e, capital E. T R U S C A N S. This is an Etruscan couple. And it was their sarcophagus. And as you can guess, their remains were inside this sarcophagus. Those have disappeared, whether they were stolen or that the um, people that the archaeologists, sorry, who, who found this uh, sarcophagus uh, didn't care and just threw them away you know or, or gave them to the i don't know what happened to the mains they're not in the museum at the Louvre. i can tell you that but the sarcophagus now empty is intact from the way it looked when it was placed 2500 more than that years ago underground in their tomb and i've been to that tomb and i've been to many etruscan tombs and it'll send a chill up your spine when you walk through them because the Etruscans had a new religious belief, or unique, I should say new, sorry. They had their own or a unique religious belief, and that leads to um, <clears throat> the, um, actually it's on the bottom, I'm sorry, of the page before, I forgot. On your list of terms to know, the next definition, this one is a bizarre definition, but it relates to the meaning of this. So you do want to write it, cult of the dead, that is something you may, have heard that phrase associated with the Grateful Dead rock band. No, 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 nothing of connecting the two. Cult of the Dead, here we go. It was a religious belief of the ancient Etruscans. We don't have to say ancient because they, they died out. So you can just say, I'll start over. The Cult of the Dead was a religious belief of the Etruscans in which they thought, yeah, someone else wants to hang on. <laughs> Okay, welcome. It was a religious belief of the ancient Etruscans, the cult of the dead, in which they thought their deceased ancestors. I'm not going to listen though. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to have to start over. The cult of the dead, sorry, was a religious belief of the Etruscans in which they thought their deceased ancestors would come to life every night inside their tombs and party until dawn. <laughs> now that should get your attention. Huh? That is not like any other religion I've ever read about or heard of or known. Uh, it's a unique religious concept. It's not heaven. It's not hell. It's not nirvana. It's not reincarnation. It's nothing. It's not Buddhist. It's not Christian. It's not Jewish. It's not Muslim. It's a unique religion. I'll say it again. The cult of the dead was a religious belief of the Etruscans in which they thought their deceased relatives would come to life every night inside their tombs and party till dawn. And then, of course, that means that they're, of course, we're talking about their-, their What happened to people who were dismembered and uh, stuff? I, I, the good question. I've never read any explanation of that. Yeah, that's a good, maybe they had, you know, their mortuary, you know, like some have done <laughs> pretty amazingly with, uh, you know, when someone has an accident, right, for a funeral. <clears throat> whatever i this is a good question i don't know the answer to it honestly um but if they were intact and this couple was found they're probably just a skeleton by the time archaeologists found this uh during napoleon's times like 200 years ago so it was already 23 centuries old the sarcophagus and the bodies inside 
So like I said, I don't know what happened to the bodies. I assume they were discarded because they wouldn't take them back to Paris. That would make sense. They might have given them to some science lab or something. And in any case, this couple was buried in a tomb inside the sarcophagus. And according to that religious belief, that cult of the dead, they would come to life and party with all their other ancestors, you know, that were also buried in the same tomb. These are large tombs. I've walked through about half a dozen. They're open to the public. If you go to Italy and only, I think it's like a dozen that many have been found and they're still finding new ones. These predate the Roman empire. So it is really early Italian um, uh, culture. And they were actually a kingdom, not an empire. They didn't try to conquer anything outside Italy, but they ruled all of Italy or just about all of Italy, all the way up to the Alps. And, and the Roman people were under their rule for years. And that's something a lot of people don't realize. The Romans, of course, it, we, you know, they didn't start out as an empire, but they started out as a vassal or subject, you could use that word, uh, subject uh, city under the rule of uh, the Etruscans. Were they, they were, like mad uh, at the Etruscans when they defected mm -hmm. and became their own nation or... Was there something that sparked a departure from the, you mean the Romans? Yes, yes, there was. And we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, it's one of the must know slides coming up. Yes, it's a good question. Yeah, there was. But for now, we're just focusing on the early Etruscan period. At this point, Rome was under their rule. Etruscans had had 400 years of ruling over Italy, including all the other cities in, uh, like Rome that they, they had uh, dominated. Uh, and they were very advanced culture. Um, they, besides this strange religious belief, um, they had a very prosperous, you could just say a prosperous culture. Advance is subjective, what, what does that mean? But certainly they were prosperous and, and relatively peaceful, except that the Romans didn't like being ruled. So, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and answer your question now and now I'll repeat it when we get to that slide that relates to that. The Romans were uh, aggressive and uh, uh, independent uh, people, right? They, they did not like being ruled by outsiders. So they rebelled successfully uh, in the, around 500, so not long after this sarcophagus, uh, they kicked the Etruscans out. And from that point on, they began to conquer Etruscan cities nearby. That's how the Romans got started with their empire, was slowly at first expanding beyond their own city walls to conquer the surrounding Etruscan sites. You'll have to write that because that's more specific. But it was a good question, so I wanted to answer it. Uh, while, while it was fresh <laughs> in people's minds. Okay, so the only other thing to add is another one other definition, and it's a short one, so it's, it should be easy to write. Necropolis, some of you may already know if you know anything about Greek history or the Greek language, that means the city of the dead. So here we go, it's a short definition. Necropolis, now that's the second one down on the next page, you see uh, below, sarcophagus. A necropolis is, quote, a city of the dead, with fancy tombs arranged along a street-like pattern, period. Again, I'll repeat that. Necropolis is a city of the dead with fancy tombs arranged along a street-like pattern. So are there any necropolises you can think of anywhere in the Bay Area or anywhere back East, like a particular city in Louisiana? Or how about in Paris? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody been to a necropolis? They're all over. Well, okay, Oakland has one, Mountain View Cemetery. Uh, there's one south of San Francisco. There are no cemeteries. Coma. Coma, yeah, Coma, yeah. Necropolis. Yeah, yeah. And in Paris, in they're everywhere. If you if you ever go Coma to Paris, down. they're all over. Yeah, Coma, C-O-L-M-A is, is the big one that's uh, used by the city of San Francisco because they, there's no uh, not enough land for them. They used to have cemeteries and they uprooted them all. You ever see the movie Poltergeist, you, you know what that leads to, right? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so the point is there are, and, and of course, a necropolis uh, would apply to any really, in other words, very, you can guess these were not the poor people cemeteries, okay, when I say fancy tombs, this couple, let's finish the meaning here and then we'll do a formal analysis. It should be obvious from the way they're dressed, but if it isn't, then you should write this. They were wealthy and probably among the ruling class uh, in, in that city, that Etruscan city uh, cemetery. 
uh, and they were, um, you know, probably maybe even a king and queen, but I, I, they would we'd probably know that. So just say uh, they were part of the ruling class, and only the wealthy could afford to bury their dead in a sarcophagus inside a tomb in a necropolis, <laughs> right? In other words, did in fancy cities. they yes. die? Um, did one person die and then they reopen the tomb when the other died? Yes. Or did yes. they kill the yeah, wife when the husband died? It. You know, you said it perfectly. Yes, that's how it would work. Uh, I think throughout recorded history, women have usually had longer life expectancy. I mean, you did hear how the American average life expectancy among all ethnic groups and both, well, okay, male, female, and otherwise, when you add it, it's over a year shorter than it was a year ago. And what does that tell you what we've been through, obviously? But in general, women would outlive their husbands even in ancient times. So yeah, probably the husband died first. And then, then the uh, the wife here. I was kind of wondering if they like kill the wife whenever the husband died. Because oh, that's a myth that Hollywood propagated. It a lot of movies about Egyptian pharaohs. I've seen a few. I have some from the fifties and sixties where they just like they 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 said the slaves built the uh, pyramids, which we all know now is not true. No, that I mean I say it would never ever happened in the ancient world, but. It was. You think they right. were too advanced in the yes, th this culture was something like that. Yeah. Now let's next. Don't write this last part before we move on to the form analysis in, in, in the next slide. I'm going to go up close here, and do you notice something about their pose and their hands? I just have to. Pay. One of the first times I ever taught this club. Hey, it was the first time I taught this class at the JC. Uh, your fire chief then. I'm sure he's retired now who always had corny jokes, but this one stuck in my mind. He said, I know what's going on. They're asking each other, where's the remote? No, you had it last. Oh, it fell behind the sofa. It looks like they're talking about something like not obviously a, t a TV screen or a computer screen or you know whatever. It's some entertainment is what they're looking at. They're looking at some kind of dance or performance or other live entertainment, which means what? Here's the last thing you could add this one more fact about this whole, the meaning of this slide specifically, that what does it mean party? And, and it means that their servants, so maybe some of you already thought of this, would often be buried with them when they died and those servants would entertain them. So if you were a servant, you didn't get to get out of that role in the next life. You just were stuck with your master. <laughs> And you would then at least get to wake up and have some wine maybe, and then you'd have to dance, sing, play musical instruments, what have you, to entertain uh, the uh, the people that the tomb was built for. So they had, they believed the servants would come to life as well to entertain them. Uh, okay, yeah, here we go, another person wants to come in. Welcome. We just finished the meaning of this slide, but as you know, it's being recorded so you can watch it on Friday after 7 p.m. on YouTube. All right, let's do a formal analysis because we need to pick up the pace. Um, this is uh, weighted obviously toward the right, right of course. Um, I, I would say top to bottom, it's balanced depending on where you draw the line because their two figures together are about equal mass to the, uh, the bed. And again, the largest mass might be slightly, maybe the bed slightly larger, I guess. And then it would be, if you could see them both, you, you might say it would be the husband. We can't see from here. So just say them as a couple because they, they're obviously uh, connected in this image. So you could say the second largest mass is them and then the pillows they're leaning on. <clears throat> and then we have the similar texture is superb here, isn't it? Look at the carved line. It's all done with carved line on their faces. And you see they wore dreads, right? That's not obvious. Uh, and they had interesting um, features too, if you look at them there. It doesn't look like you know most people today in Italy would look. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, the human bodies, the two heads, the arms, the legs, the feet. That, that's another detail I like to emphasize. <laughs> look at that. He's barefoot and she's wearing sandals. Yeah. At least I think that's what's going on here. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. And then it's stable. Uh, look carefully. I know there's some curved lines at the end of the bed and the top. Well, even the top of his head is practically straight. Hers isn't. So they're wearing some kind of, or she's wearing a headdress. But other than those details, uh, it, most of the lines and the um, placement of their figures in the bed itself is mostly stable. Uh, and then the colors of warm earth tone, of course. And um, 
let's see, we mentioned it. Oh yeah, there's no modeling because it's, it's buried in the uh, uh, dark, of course, underground. By the way, they went to, you don't have to write this, but the, the, the people who had their ancestors buried in these tombs would go put food at least once a week is what historians think at the entrance of the tomb come back a week later and the food was gone. And they assumed that's because their relatives got up and brought it inside the tomb and ate it during their partying after midnight. But of course it was probably some passerby or groundskeeper that ate the food, but it was a convenient way for them to believe their own myths, let's put it that way. Okay, uh, I think I covered everything right here, okay. Here's one of those tombs. And if I recall, I think I gave you guys a break because I, um, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, I, I took it off the must know list, but this is what we were talking about. Now they've been emptied of the sarcophagi, that's plural sarcophagus, of course. But can you see here some of the, there, let's go up close. These are their servants that are entertaining them. And look at what unusual uh, outfits they're wearing. I mean, this looks more like a traditional toga, which not just the Romans and Greeks, a lot of ancient cultures around the Mediterranean War. But these do both look like female dancers. It's hard to tell. I can't really tell for sure. Here are musicians. Let's back it up. Um, and then and then you see it, uh, someone else with a different kind of, looks like a some kind of a small um, symbol or something or castanet or whatever. Yeah, of course, that that's very modern. So they, they were entertained during these, uh, you know, after dark, right? Uh, period. So you have to wonder if anyone ever, just out of curiosity, wanted to go see Uncle Mort get up and do a dance and go into the tomb where he was buried after midnight to see if he was doing it. Somehow, I imagine most of the adults figured that it was just a, a story, and yet they told their children that this is what happened to the ancestors that had passed away. And so I don't know how much of it they believed, but that was what their priest taught. Okay. So here's another view, isn't that? A, yeah, this one I got to go inside of. You see how many how many sarcophagi they could get into? You know, there are dozens of them. This is just a small uh, section here. If of, the servants didn't get sarcophagi, what? How are they buried? Oh, or probably in stored? a shroud. You know, in a shroud, uh, almost like a mummy, except it's just over their whole body, not over their hands and feet. That's what I recall reading when I was there. I was there in, oh gosh, 2000. And uh, there was a lot, there was a whole museum next to the cemetery at Cervatary, which is a particularly interesting museum. And I got to tell you, if you're squeamish about open uh, graphic images of uh, physical intimacy between men, women, women and women, men and men, and animals and humans, don't go in that museum. <laughs> The Etruscans were very open about their sexuality, is what I'm saying. In fact, uh, shockingly so, e even by the standards of the ancient world. And it shows in some of their art, not, not in most of their tombs, but in the museum, you know, on, on pottery, painted pottery and stuff. Anyway, so the next must know, here we go, is this one. It's a porta, okay. I got, I got to give this, let's see. Oh, did I cut that? No, I think I, yeah, again, I'm giving you guys a break. Um, no, I, this is, it's on the syllabus. I apologize. Here it is. Sorry. It's the third one down. There we go. On tonight's list. Porta, two words, Augusta. A-U-G-U-S-T-A. A-U-G-U-S-T-A. -A. Porta, Augusta. The location is the city in Italy. Perugia. P E R U. G-I-A, 200 B.C. or B.C.E. Okay, this is the last surviving portion <coughs> of a city wall, or you could just say it's a gate. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, something in my throat. Let me just take a quick, very quick coffee. Swig of coffee. Okay, thank you. Okay, once again, this is the last surviving section of a, an Etruscan city wall, or you could just say the last surviving Etruscan city gate, because there is more to it than this photo shows, <clears throat> but it is only a portion, a small portion of the original walls that surrounded that city, the city of Perugia, uh, which is in like central Italy. It was the last Etruscan city, it's all part of the meeting that you should be writing, that Perugia was the last Etruscan city to fall to the Romans. 
And you can see the date here, if you, if you do the math, is more than 300 years later than the sarcophagus. In other words, by the time of this uh, gate, the Romans had conquered almost every other Etruscan city. This was the last one to hold out. It held out for many years. So when the Romans conquered this last Etruscan city to fall to the Romans, Perugia, they sort of, you could say, grudgingly honored the you know, bravery, the courage of the, the defenders. And after executing them, <laughs> that's what the Romans would do if they resist. But they left parts of that city intact and made it into their own walled city. So you could just say the Romans kept the walls and then, you know, added to them when they took over this city, even if they didn't treat the inhabitants very kindly. Uh, so they, they were kind of indirectly showing that they had some, you know, I'd call it grudging respect for the tenacity, right? And, and the um, uh, courage of, of the inhabitants who held out against them uh, for many years behind these walls. And the city, of course, is inside the gates there, right? Now, of course, it's a big city. It's modern and it's got, you know, university. And it's grown outside the walls. So this was the last Etruscan city to fall to the Romans. And the Romans kept this gate in a, a section of the old Etruscan walls and incorporated it into their own new fortifications for that city. So what does that give us an idea of the Romans? Well, I didn't give you the year. It fell in about 100 BC. Yeah, that, that's not a, well, it's part of the meaning. So you probably should write that. Uh, that means that a hundred years after this gate was built, the Romans finally conquered this city. And you know they did massacre the, the male inhabitants and sold the women and children into slavery. That was their typical, most ancient world cultures, you know, empires at least did do that to the people they conquered. But they did have about what the Etruscans now uh, at this site, after the walls were finished, they managed to remain free of Roman rule and keep the Romans out for at least a hundred years. And so that's that's itself a major accomplishment. So that's the whole meaning, really. Oh, no, there is one more thing. See this here? Some of you can tell by looking. That is not Etruscan. It's not even close. It's Italian Renaissance. So some Italian architect in the Renaissance added the, 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 the brick, and that's brick, of course, sections. So the walls ended here, right? There might have been brick on top of them, and then it's missing here. So these were the two pylons. Remember that word? We saw it with the Egyptian Karnak temple, right? Entrance. <laughs> so these are pylons. So I don't know if the Etruscans traded with the Egyptians. They probably did. I'm sure they did, right? Uh, in any case, they're using that technique of, of tapered walls, you know, uh, which of course kind of strengthens the walls of that. In this case, it's a city, not, not a temple like it was at Karnak. And then the gate is missing itself. Of course, probably a big, heavy cast iron gate long gone uh, but the arch is still there and these are the decorations and look at those columns now this is the first slide this is a new slide i got off the internet not from the slide library at santa rosa and i've never noticed look at this see where the arrow is you don't have to write this but you could if you want that the columns in between the circles the only decoration in the entire walls until the italian renaissance edition up there which is you should just say you know it's not part of the original thing you would analyze if this is on not saying it will be or, or it might be cut, but uh, just make sure you write this, of course, in case we don't cut it. These columns are, um, they look like Minoan columns, don't they? We just were looking at the Minoans, remember last week? So they must have traded with the Minoans and the Egyptians, which makes sense. You know, at that point in time, you know, 200 BC or so, the um, the Egyptians were already under Greek rule and Greece and Italy are side by side. They traded with each other. So, so just say that there was evidence in the design of the small decorative panels. That's what they are, panels of the of influence from Minoan architecture or Minoan columns. And that the pylons are very similar to the Egyptians. Okay, that's plain on the meaning of this. There's not anything more to add to that. It is balance. If you could imagine this wasn't there originally, right? And it was just this even, you know, of course, this part was higher because perhaps that's where they put their main archers, you know, bowmen, men with bows and arrows to be outlooks, to look out over the countryside for approaching enemies. Uh, but they also had, I'm sure they had soldiers stationed all along the walls. So these would have been, they're the same height, these two pylons, 
the center section is slightly higher, but they're balanced because obviously the pylons, well, you can't see it in this picture, but they are the same width and height. So it's balanced left to right, but you could make the case it's weighted toward the top here because the empty space of the missing gate there, which is sky below the arch. So it's weighted more toward the top. <clears throat> and then we have the rhythm, of course, of these decorative panels, right? The columns and, and circles and the two arches and the two pylons, the same shapes repeated. Uh, and then each section of, of stone, of course, these stones are almost all the same size and, and shape, aren't they? It's all a cool color. The only thing warm is what was added by Renaissance architects. This is not original. That also was added, that fill, fill in there. It wasn't original. It would have been an open arch just like below. So just say originally it was a completely cool, uh, sort of grayish, stone color and the texture is only real rough texture of stone unless you want to get more detailed say there's real rough brick texture on the addition but you don't have to write about that part this is not original the largest mass would be the two pylons and then it would be um, i guess the lower archway or main gateway and then the upper archway in that order there's no technique for modeling it wouldn't be shadows this must have been a, a overcast day because you don't see any shadows except a little bit under the arch, I guess. Yeah, there. Natural sunlight creates the modeling. And there is carved line here, but only on the uh, small decorations, or section, I mean, of, of, of panels, decorative panels. Uh, all the other line is visual light, as most architectural light is, you know, which, you know, here you do see the edges formed by, well, by shadowing. Okay, and then, um, let's see, balance. Oh, stable or dynamic? Well, it's both. The main central gate section is is pretty stable, right? Except for the arches, those are obviously dynamic. The pylons, well, if you just looked at the front of them, that's stable, right? But when you look at the edges tapering upward, they're slightly dynamic, so it, it's both. Okay. Uh, oh, space, that would help, <laughs> yeah, for space. You know what? I don't know if I did space on the sarcophagus. I don't think I did. I'll go back to it. Uh, there, this is about a 50 foot high wall, right? Oh, actually, it's a little more. So the pylons are about 50 feet. The, the middle wall is about 55 feet, or just say a little over 50 feet. The two pylons about 50 feet, and the archway is about 25 feet high, the open arch. Okay, let, let us do, um, just I forgot to, uh, for space, there's only one technique here. It's real three-dimensional objects, you know, two human figures on top of a sofa right That's what it looks like to me or bed and but there is overlapping of course the two figures overlap each other and the bed i forgot to say that sorry okay let's move on to the next must know and this is one that has uh, a direct relation to the question one of you asked a few minutes ago about how did the um, romans rebel and or why did they rebel against the etruscans so this is our third must know tonight and it's called she wolf it's the second one down. Just those two words, she, wolf, and the location is Rome, and the date is 500 BC or BCE. So this is a bronze sculpture of obviously a female wolf or uh, wolf mother, you could say, and two human babies suckling underneath her. So how does that come up? Some of you may know this story. If you don't, you should write it. This is an illustration of the foundation myth that the Romans had about their own city, their foundation myth. Of course, you know, that means the beginning of any culture. What stories they tell themselves, each culture has them, uh, was how they got started. So here's that myth. Two Roman, no, sorry, they weren't Roman yet. I misspoke. Two babies, two human babies, you should say, human babies, were abandoned in the woods by their parents. And they were found by a she-wolf and adopted by the she-wolf, which is what this is illustrating, and raised by that she-wolf. And when they grew to adulthood, they became the founders of the city of Rome. And some of you know their names. So if you want to write this part of the meaning, Romulus, you don't have to know their names, but it, I'll spell them. R-U-M-U-L-U-S and Remus, R-E-M-U-S. These were the two founders of Rome, supposedly raised in the woods, in the wilds, by a she-wolf. Well, you know, there's a phrase, one of my favorite uh, 
uh, fellow teachers used to use in when he taught history class, he'd say, that explains everything. The Romans were aggressive. This part you should write, not that last thing I just said. But the Romans were a aggressive culture, as we all know, and they were territorial. Boy, were they. They were all about more and more territory that they could rule. And they were violent. And that pretty much fits what the lifestyle of a wolf has to be because of nature. And it's not a matter of choice. You know, it's a survival of the fittest, obviously. And, um, you know, the wilds, uh, if you're a wolf or any other animal that has to hunt for a living. So it kind of fits that they taught themselves that myth, that foundation myth. Is so that this, something they really believe or is that more metaphorical? I think it's the more educated people, it's a lot like, you know, we see happening in our own culture and many others today. It's a good question. Yeah, um, it, it's probably most people who were well educated, the upper classes and even just, you know, there were plenty of uh, poets and authors and and of course, professors and teachers and, and, and academies similar to, but not quite the same as universities, right? Um, and so they probably didn't believe it. But the masses, some of them probably did. Some did. So yeah, it was a matter of perhaps how well, either how well informed or how well educated, how worldly they were. If somebody had traveled to other parts of the world and heard their all of the foundation myths and said, they can't all be true, right? Somebody's making it up, or maybe they all are. Yeah, it's a good question. So yeah, some did and some didn't. And more often it's usually based on the higher level of education, the less like you are to believe in these myths. That isn't always true, but often. Okay, one last fact about the meaning. How did this get created? The Etruscans created this because they were the greatest bronze sculptures of the uh, sculptors. Sorry, T O R S. I'll say it again. The Etruscans created this sculpture as a gift to their Roman subjects. And another fact, I, I, I need to make sure you add this here that the Etruscans were considered, or historians consider, the Etruscans to be the greatest bronze sculptors of the ancient world. If you go to any of those museums, by the way, it's not just the uh, cemetery, but all over Italy, wherever there's an Etruscan museum, there are lots of them in Italy where they found a cemetery, right, and stuff nearby. Uh, you'll see how beautiful their bronze sculpture is. They captured the inner thoughts, emotions, and even spirits or souls of some of their subjects. And the Romans learned from them after conquering them and destroying their cities, they often would adopt the techniques the Etruscans had. So just say that the Etruscans were considered the greatest sculptors in the ancient world. And this was a gift to the Romans. Why? To placate the Romans, to try and appease, either word will do, or placate the Romans who were already feeling rebellious this far back. And within a few decades, I think it was, uh, you know, not long after this, just say shortly after this, the Romans succeeded in rebelling against the Etru their Etruscan rulers not long after. This. So what would this have been for? Probably one of their main temples in Rome, in the early city of Rome, while it was still ruled by the Etruscans. It was meant to be placed there. But you know, the Romans would have seen it as a symbol of their, of their subservience, right? Or the su subjection or control of their city by the Etruscans. And who knows what they did with it, but here it is. Now, some historians think these two figures, it's supposed to be Romulus and Remus, the two uh, babies, uh, were, were added later by uh, Renaissance sculptors. There's no certainty of that, but we know that there was such a sculptor with two human figures of those two Roman you know, founders. Uh, as babies uh, that was given as a gift uh, by the Etruscans. The Romans mention that in their records. And it, at least for, for several years or decades stood in one of their main buildings, probably a temple. Okay, now it's in the Vatican, by the way, if you're curious, in, in Rome. All right, formal analysis. It's cool, isn't it? A hot color. It's kind of a bluish color. Bronze is usually warm, but here it's cool. And of course, it's got the rhythm of the legs, the teeth, the two human babies, their arms and hands, her face, her ears. And let's go up close because her, her look how fierce her expression is. She's very defensive of her adopted uh, human babies. It's really kind of a touching, where I've seen it, it's very powerful when you see, it's right at eye level at the top of a staircase too. So it really gets your attention. Uh, anyway, so then we also have there's carved line, of course, uh, obviously when it was made out of a clay ma mold. And that is where the cement texture is superb, isn't it? On her fur, her face, the human babies, the, her muscles. Uh, and it is almost entirely stable on her. 
the two human babies are mostly upright too aren't they really except for you know the, their upper arms right and, well actually his legs so you, there's some obviously dynamic detail on the humans babies but but mostly especially when you look at just the wolf the she-wolf it's more stable than dynamic the largest mass that's easy <laughs> the she-wolf and then the two human babies are about the same mass uh and then let's see th there is um uh for space it's life size and i don't see overlapping here it's just three 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 three-dimensional objects in real space life size you should uh, for for space it's, there's no techniques for space uh and it's roughly balanced you know if you draw a line down here with her body and her, her hind quarters or hips there and the two human babies i would say it's roughly balanced top to bottom and left to right um yeah i think okay let's see how we're doing we're doing really well on time so this this piece here is is part of that foundation list so that's the main point to remember if it's on the exam okay now we get to the actual romans and there's a lot to say about them so here's what we're going to do we we may take a slightly earlier break and if so that would indicate we can end earlier than usual which i don't think anybody object to uh, but next week i will show you my own slides of rome because I think it's best to finish the must know first, which of course gives people, you know, the freedom to do as you choose. Uh, but my slides of Rome turned out pretty good. These are the best from four different trips to Rome. I, the last time I went to Rome, I was a guest of the Roman, uh, not the Roman, this the, it sounds like the Roman or Italian of the city tourism agency. Each big city in Italy and most European countries have their own, what to say in the US too, you know. And if you're savvy enough and you write well enough, you can get free trips all over the world. Well, not now, but once the pandemic's over. So I was invited to go as a journalist to write about uh, Italian uh, food and wine and restoration of Italian architectural sites. It was a wonderful trip. So you, anyway, for those who want to, after next week, when we finish with the, you see the list is shorter. It's only got four slides on it. Uh, we will show my own slides. And then we will, after the break, talk about how to study for the test, how it's going to be given. I'll show you a sample of what it looks like. And then we'll still end a little bit early, perhaps next week. Okay. So we won't rush through these slides because now I'm going to say this is a slide that absolutely will not be cut from the study list. So take very careful notes. It's a very important work. And uh, so let us now talk about the meaning. Okay. But first the title. Augustus of Prima Porta, P-R-I, it's one word, P-R-I-M-A-P-O-R-T-A. -A. Augustus, in case you didn't know, what most of you I'm sure do, was he was the first Roman emperor. So it's a portrait of the first Roman emperor. And of Prima Porta implies that it was, on top of which it was, the main gate. The main gate to what? To the city of Rome. And if time permits, I don't know if we'll get that far with my own slides, depending on how late the must know that part of the lecture runs next week. Uh, I might have time to show you my slides of the gates of Rome, because if you have time to do that, most tourist American, at least, tourists don't do that. Uh, you can rent a car or a bicycle. I just walked. I took a bus to the outer edge of the city and then walked out into the countryside through the ancient Roman walls. They're still standing around the north edge of the, the city. Uh, anyway, so let's now talk about the meaning of this. Specifically, it is a portrait of the first Roman emperor, Augustus Caesar. That's C-E-A-S-E-R or A-R? <laughs> anyway, you could just say Augustus because you may know his uh, name was the basis for the month of August that was named after him. But there's a lot to say about him. So let's start with the fact that if you just say he was the first Roman emperor, that doesn't tell you a lot. It's much more power. He was much more important and powerful than just being the first Roman emperor. How did he get to be the first Roman emperor? So here we go. I'm going to tell you that. And I know that you guys don't want your you know, hands to start crimping. So if you want to just listen for about the next two, three minutes, and then I'll summarize it at the end. But it's enough facts that I think you should have and then decide which ones you want to remember or write to study for the exam. This has a, yes, please. Oh, another person wants to come in. Sorry. This has a very high possibility of being on the, on, on the midterm. Okay. So how did Augustus become the first Roman emperor? 
So it's the first part of the meaning in your notes. Well, first of all, he was Julius Caesar's nephew. And when Julius Caesar died, that started a civil war. And he sided with the winning side, those who avenged his uncle's murder. You know, he was assassinated. Everybody knows that Julius Caesar, right? Stabbed by fellow senators. Gosh, we start thinking about things. History does a way of repeating. It almost happened in January 6th, my God. Anyway, certainly that's the first time I've thought that fact that, yeah, hmm. Yeah, but of course, <clears throat> this, we know the facts, was an assassination by jealous, right, people who hated Julius, his uncle. So he avenged his uncle's murder by waging war against the murderers, the assassins, or those who had plotted against his uncle, against Julius, and he won it. Then he became a co-ruler. There were three, it's called, you don't have to know the word, triumvirate, but just say there were three co-rulers for a while. He was just one of them. If that's all, he'd still be an important person, but a, not a major person in the history of the world, but he is. What happened after that was Cleopatra. If you don't know this, you should be writing this now. Cleopatra sided with one of his generals named Mark Anthony. <laughs> uh, you know the story, some of you, and to overthrow the Roman Empire. And they came pretty close. And guess who led the victorious army that defeated the Egyptians and Mark Antony, won a second civil war within 30 years, or no, 20, sorry, 20 years. Can you imagine how much we went through? Well, you know, if you know your history, American Civil War was the largest loss of life we've ever had in any war, more than World War II. If we'd had to have fought two civil wars within a generation, I don't think our country would have survived, but he was able to victoriously defeat two groups of rebels, you could call them, or plotters, whatever you want to call them, and win two civil wars within 20 years. Of course, the people of Rome admired him and were grateful to him, so they declared him emperor. He became, that's how he became the first Roman emperor. So you want to summarize that however you feel like, uh, but I think you get the point. Is He, he was a more than victorious military, you could say genius, or just, you just want to say victor, victorious Roman uh, leader in two civil wars. And by the end of the second one, he had become so popular that the Roman people actually wanted him to be emperor. Julius Caesar didn't ask. He, he seized power. And, you know, if if he had been killed, when he, don't write this, but if he had been killed by those sinners, he might have been killed by someone in the streets or some other rival uh, because he never, you know, took a poll, asked or thought about what the public wanted. But Augustus Caesar, it's different. He, he was so popular and so uh, the people of Rome were so grateful for what he had done to save them from two civil wars that they wanted him to be their first emperor. So here are two other facts. He ruled the longest of any Roman emperor, 45 years as the ruler of the largest empire on earth. That's a made right there. That's a major accomplishment. He made it into his 80s. Back then, that was very unusual. And now let's go here. He also had his adopted son. You don't have to know that guy's name, but I'll give it to you for those who care. Tiberius. There's a river through Rome called the Tiber, as some of you know. So the, his adopted son was T I B E. R I U S, but you don't have to write that. You can just say his adopted son is shown here. You see where the arrow is? Accepting the surrender of barbarians. You know, barbarians were anyone that were, wasn't Roman, Re rebelling armies that he had defeated, Julius Caesar's son. Because now, Julius Caesar being emperor, he didn't personally lead the armies into battle anymore. He'd already done that. He didn't need to do that. So his uh, adopted son did. So he declared Tiberius his successor and Tiberius became a ho horrible emperor, uh, really, really corrupt. But Julius Caesar was not corrupt. Every, every hist I've read biographies of him and historians accounts, uh, not just Italian historians. Um, he wasn't corrupt. He was a very competent ruler. He built public sanitation. You could just see he built public works and keep it simple. For he, mass uh, Sorry, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Please. Did he adopt the kid because he loved the wife? Uh, yes, the good question. You guys don't have to write this, but I cannot think of a better way to know all these things that you're asked that this question brings up than to watch a series the BBC produced over 40 years ago, and no one's done a better job of talking about the first four 
Roman emperors and their personal lives. It's called I, as in the pronoun, Claudius. Claudius was the fourth Roman emperor, his nephew, uh, Augustus's nephew. So yes, to answer your question, yes, his second marriage was to a powerful Roman noblewoman named Livia, and it was her son that he adopted after, just say many historians believe that his second wife had his biological sons murdered because they died under mysterious circumstances. He had two biological sons and a daughter biologically by his first marriage. And the daughter was exiled. Some think she was framed. Uh, you don't need to know the details, but if you wanna see some really interesting personal, and the actors in that, are so good. John Hurt, you may have heard, he won the Academy Award for Elephant Man. He's a British actor. He died recently. He plays Caligula, the third emperor. Did he still love her after? Uh, yes, he did. He, he didn't believe. His... Yeah, good point you're raising. It just, Children. they loved each other, and yet she was playing him. That's what you could say if you want to really cut to the chase in mm. modern parlance. Yeah, <laughs> she probably misled him to the point where he just or he was in what you call willful denial. You know what I mean? He, he didn't want to see the evidence. Eventually, he did figure out that something nefarious was happening to his family, but he never believed it was her that was doing it until right before he died, if that BBC series is correct, he did guess that she had been doing it. And supposedly she had him poisoned by smearing poison on his uh, figs. He loved figs and he had his own garden. They lived separately, by the way. That was common among the upper classes in Rome. They each had their own villa about a mile apart and they slept with whoever they wanted to. That was just the way it was among upper classes. So it's a very juicy <laughs> set of circumstances you, if you care to know. And I, Claudius, it's, it's on DVD. I think it's Netflix, either Netflix, Amazon has a streaming. Uh, it's superb. Uh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it, it goes into, and the actors are all first rate. British Shakespearean stage actors who then became film actors because of this series was so popular. It was, uh, it was on the front page of Time magazine. How many times does the BB series make it to the front page of American magazine like Time? Because it was so popular. Yeah, we'd have watch parties that far back for that show. Um, that was late, late 70s, I think, or early 80s. Anyway, back to the last facts about the meaning. So that depicts his adopted son because his biological children were gone by that time. So he didn't have much other choice. I mean, you know, you can't prove Olivia did these things that that TV series implies, but many historians believe the evidence, overwhelming circumstantial evidence points to her as having manipulated her son into that position. And then she became the mother of the emperor. She way outlived him. She was 20 years younger than him. And of course she was therefore, you know, like the most powerful woman in Rome. Who can anybody guess who this is? We, we just had a holiday that some people mid February 14th. Uh, Cupid, Cupid, yeah. Cupid was an ancient um uh, minor god of Greek and Rome that symbolized, of course, romantic and other not just romantic forms of love and admiration that one human can feel for another. So, why is that there? Is the last thing you should write about the meaning. The statue of Cupid is symbolizing the love the people of Rome had for Emperor Augustus because he had saved them from two dreadful civil wars. And when he took over, it started, I didn't actually say this. So if you, if you don't know this phrase, you should write it. The Pax, P-A-X is, is Latin for peace. Romana, just like it sounds, Romana, one word. That's a 200 year peace period, I'm sorry, of peace and prosperity. He started it. He was the one that initiated it. So of course, he's one of the most influential people in, in, in the history of uh, the ancient world or period, really, you could say. And of course, you can see maybe if you don't, I don't know if you want to write this, self supreme self-confidence. Um, you know, obviously he had to <laughs> first to overcome two sets of enemies who were trying to kill him, of course, and take over the empire from him, but uh, also then to rule peacefully for 45 years rather unusual. Uh, they were lucky, the Romans, that they had this guy when they they got him, and yet after him came this corrupt, horrible person, Tiberius. Was, if you watch that series, you'll see why I say that. Okay, and then the last thing is, where was it? I said already, but if you didn't write it, you might want to add this one last uh, sentence and the meaning. This, the original version of this sculpture, there are many copies and they were sent throughout the Roman Empire, but the first version was placed above the main gates to the city of Rome. Now, 
don't write this part, that's enough. But Stockstad, at least the last edition, I don't have the most recent one, but they stopped sending them to us teachers about four years ago. But the, the last edition I looked at, she claims that this uh, originally was created for Hadrian's Villa. No, Hadrian lived a hundred years later. Yes, he had copies of Augustus because he admired him as his predecessor, as the founder of the empire, you know, as a, as a good role model, right? And so, yes, there were gates in front of a villas later on. Roman emperors had this statue of their predecessor, their founder. But the original purpose was to show off the city of Rome being under a strong, powerful ruler. You would pass underneath this sculpture when you entered the city of Rome from the north, which is what most people did, because look at Europe. Italy is in the southern part of Europe. So if you're coming from any other part of the empire into Rome, you're probably going to pass through that gateway. And this statue would have greeted you. You would have seen it looking up above you, about 50 feet above your head. OK, formal analysis. It's a warm yellow color of marble. I love this color. And it's got really good symmetry texture on the armor, on the face, right? And the hair, of course and uh, the, uh, the robe. That's all done with carved line, of course. There's no painted line here. They're not sure if this was ever painted. Probably not because it wouldn't have stood up to the, be standing in front of a gate. You know, they do have winter weather in Rome and it rains a lot. So I doubt it was ever painted. In any case, we, we don't know. We just know now. The color is a warm yellowish color. And then we have balance. Well, of course he's standing upright. And to me, the arm raised, he is in contrapposto, if you're curious. You don't have to mention that fact as part of the meaning because that's more associated with the Greek slides we saw last week. But he is standing with his weight on this leg and this leg is slightly in front of that one and it's loose, right? And he's holding a spear right here, right? Uh, or at least something like a spear. A staff, well, it'd be an awfully long staff. So it's probably a spear missing its point. Yeah. In any case, he uh, he is, you know, maybe you think of it as unbalanced slightly to the left, would be the right from his point of view, uh, because his arm is raised. But to me, that and the spear balance each other out. And he's totally balanced. So it's mostly balanced. You could say that Cupid weights it a little bit here. But then again, look at the space occupied roughly by the base. Or, or the tree, it looked like a tree stump with Cupid on top of it. And the area of the side here of his robe overlapping, uh, I think it's roughly balanced both ways. So top to bottom and left to right. The largest mass is him. Uh, then it's a close call, maybe the base, because that's original, that part. And then the Cupid and then the spear. For space, it is six uh, feet uh, tall. He was a tall, that was tall back in the ancient world. Second tallest Roman emperor, the tallest was, we'll get to later, was uh, Constantine. <clears throat> but he, he was six feet tall. And so this statue is that, it's life size. And, but there is the technique, of course, of overlapping uh, of the armor over his body and his robes over the armor. Uh, and then we have um, the rhythm of the arms, of course, in the face and the decorative carved figures on his armor and his ro robe, folds of his robe. And there's no technique for modeling. It's just the shadows from the sun. Okay. This is an important slide, but I think I have a better view of it. No, actually I don't. That's, that's good as it is. Yeah. Um, for some reason when I translate it, no, it's okay. You know, it depends on what angle my screen is at. This is an important slide. I won't be cutting it either. Okay, it's, it's really important. Uh, this is the pont, that means bridge in uh, <clears throat> French, B-O-N-T, du, D-U, three words, gar, or garde, if we say it in English, G-A-R-D, I'll say it again, three words, P-O-N-T, pont, du, D-U, garde, G-A-R-D, this is, this is the title. Location is a city in southern France, Nîmes, N-I-M-E-S, you don't pronounce the S in French, N-I-M-E-S, France, Nîmes, France, 15 BC or BCE. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the largest remaining section of a Roman aqueduct anywhere in Europe. There may be longer sections in Africa and the Middle East. I think there are actually in Israel even, but just say in Europe, it's the largest remaining section of a Roman aqueduct in Europe. It goes for over a third of a mile, this section here. But what is an aqueduct? Well, that is our, we're getting down to where we only have uh, a few more uh, definitions. Triumphal Arch will do uh, probably next week. 
So for tonight, I think it's the last new de definition, aqueduct. It's on your list, so I shouldn't need to spell it, right? You see below the things invented by Romans. I meant to talk about that before we started the lecture, but we'd already been talking about so much else. I wanted to get going on the slide. So just remember, if these things here are listed, uh, well, I'll repeat this when we review next week for the uh, midterm. I might ask you to remember, uh, I might say things invented by the Romans included concrete, domes, and contrapposto. That would be false, right? Not true. It'll be a true false question based on the definitions. There'll be a few of those on the midterm. Well, I'll explain all this next week when we talk very detailed, thoroughly, how the test will be given, what it'll look like, and how to study for it. Okay, we'll do that next week. Okay, so you don't have to write any of these definitions, concrete, domes, aqueducts. You're going to see examples. But aqueduct is a separate standalone, right, term. So this is your definition you need to write. An aqueduct is a system for carrying water from the mountains to a city invented by the Romans, comma, sorry, it's not a short definition, but it's the last one for tonight. A system for carrying water from the mountains to a city invented by the Romans, comma, which uses conduits, you can't say pipes, they're not pipes, C-O-N-D-U-I-T-S, if you want to know the word, you have heard that word at some point, so just write it like it sounds, it's okay if you don't spell it right, which uses conduits to carry the water through the force of gravity, which uses conduits to uh, carry the water or move, sorry, I meant to say move, move the water by the force of gravity. You're not going to have to regurgitate the definitions. Even if you did, you'd have them in front of you. Remember, it's an open book test. And I give you guys 48 hours after I give the test. I'll give you a heads up now in real time online. But if you can't be there that night, you'll see it on YouTube. You'll have a whole full 48 hours from the time it's posted on YouTube. So you guys have really plenty of opportunities to make sure you get the correct answer, but you're not going to be asked to just regurgitate the definitions. That's that's too grade schoolish or whatever middle school. But you might be asked to use them, you know, correctly, uh, you know, in some analysis slide, you know, essay short slide analysis questions. So that's what this is. I'll say it again. It's a, an aqueduct is a system for carrying water from the mountains to a city, invented by the Romans, comma, which uses conduits to move the water. Uh, by the force of gravity. Of course, that means that this starts at the mountain and where the water is melting, of course, from the mountains off of the streams, you know, and the, well, even some of them are glaciers up in the Alps, but just say, you know, where the snow melts, creating the water, then there are conduits in each of these. Let's go up closer. At, you can't see them, of course, because we're looking at it from below. All three of these levels have different sizes of uh, you know, they're passageways, you know, hollowed out with lined with some kind of uh, pipe. Some people think uh, they were lined with lead, but lead could cause some lead poisoning, you know. So more people now, more historians believe they were lined with, uh, they're long gone, the linings of these conduits, long gone, of course, is 2,000 years old. We're probably lined with uh, something like maybe copper, but that's too expensive, uh, more like clay, you know, clay tile. Probably, but you don't have to know that detail. Just say there were these, these uh, conduits. See, a pipeline is impl implies something that's fully enclosed and fully 360 degree circle, right? Like a pipe uh, from your ho home plumbing. That's not what they had here. These were open conduits and the water would come slowly pouring down from the mountain. And you can see it's tilted, right? You can see that. And the gravity would keep the water moving. How long were some of these aqueducts? The longest ones were 20 miles long. And there's nothing close to that left. But uh, this, again, is about a third of a mile, this section. And it's the longest intact section of a Roman aqueduct left in all of Europe. OK, and then we have the fact that now, what is it? It's besides a historical landmark. Of course, it's protected by the United Nations. It's on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. You could add that fact. You know, UNESCO, UNESCO is that organization that is supposed to help preserve world culture. And they have a list they add to it every year. And this is on that list, the UNESCO World Heritage List. It deserves to be because it's so remaining section of it, what's left of it is remarkable. It's used as a footbridge. And until recently, until a few years ago, it was used as a traffic bridge 
buses, when I was there, and I don't say how long ago it was, mm, in late 70s, yeah, my first trip to France, um, I was still a student. Okay? There was a giant school bus that parked right here in the middle of this archway and disgorge at 60, you know how heavy that is? The bus itself plus 60 people. And the bridge did not only not shudder, it, it didn't phase it. So this was really well built as the Romans, as you know, were famous for their architectural prowess and skill. This is evidence of that fact. The fact that this survived 2000 years uh, through wars and famines and the dark ages and plagues and abandonment and you know souvenir hunters trying to chip off pieces of the, of the stone to take home and all that. It, it still functions as a footbridge, just the bottom section, not up here. You, know, that, you don't have access to that. But I've watched people walk across that bridge and now it's still being used. At least they could have closed it for that too recently. But the last time I checked, they just closed it to, to, to uh, vehicle traffic because they were worried that it might eventually start to damage it. But that's pretty impressive that for decades, it, it functioned as a, a bridge between two sections of the French countryside. Um, this is actually on the outskirts of the city. You can see that's not city <laughs> terrain there. That's a hill. But just past that hill is the outer edges of a, of a city of over 100,000 people in Roman times lived in Nimes. Now it's about a quarter of a million. Uh, and this is a river. So it's over one of the longest rivers in, uh, in France. Um, Okay, and it's not anymore functioning, of course, as a uh, aqueduct because the other sections are missing. All right, let's do the formal analysis. For space, it's 160 feet high from the you know foundation of these, they're called piers, to the top. And uh, then we have the rhythm of the arches and the piers, and that's the right word. You can say columns, but they're not because columns are separate structures that support something else and line the wall of something or in front of it. Uh, th these are P-I-E-R-S. And they do, just like a pier does, support the weight of what, you know, uh, is above it. So the arches and the piers together, of course, obviously are dynamic. The arches, the piers are stable. So it's both. And obviously the, uh, the tops of each of the three levels where the conduits are, are stable. It's obviously a, a warm color, warm kind of um, a tannish and real, or even you could even say sand color. It almost looks like sand, uh, but it's not sandstone. It's a much stronger stone or it wouldn't still be here. So the stone is the real rough texture. It's not simulated. It's a real rough texture of stone. There's the modeling, of course, is created by the shadows from the sun. There's visual line under each arch. Otherwise, there isn't really any other line, no carved line. Um, and then it is balanced, completely symmetrical. If you draw a line down the middle of this section, three arches here, one, two, three, actually it'd be down the middle of this, right? In terms of what these two yeah, ends show here. So we, we have a totally symmetrical structure, but you could make the case that it is unbalanced toward the bottom because the arches and the piers are much thicker on the first level than on the second or third. Uh, I think of it as visually balanced, both top to bottom and left to right. Of course, they're, they're obviously the rhythm. Let's see, am I missing anything? Uh, oh, for space, yeah, it's real. There is no technique for space here. Okay, let's I do one more slide here and then take our break. <clears throat> um, uh, let me see. House of the Dionysian Cult. That's what this is. Now that look, I know it's from next week, but I do, if I don't vary things a little bit, I, my lectures get stale. I don't like doing that. So you see where it is under week seven, but it's all the same subject matter. So I did tell you guys I have that option to do that occasionally. Uh, so you just look down and I'll say the title and spell it once for you. House of the Dionysus. Remember who he was? The ancient Greek and Roman god of wine. D-I-O-N-Y. S I A N Dionysian cult, House of the Dionysian cult fresco. It's a fresco. It's in Pompeii. I think everybody knows what happened to Pompeii. P O M P E W I 50 A D or or uh, C E if you prefer. This is the most mind-boggling thing when you know what you're looking at. It also will make you either cringe or you know your skin crawl if you know what you're looking at. 
This is the basement of a wealthy family's home where they conducted all kinds of obscene rituals and underage children were forced to participate. It was even by Roman standards, this saying a lot, too corrupt and too venal or, or horrible, you could say terrible, uh, of a uh, practice, what they did. For instance, here's a little uh, girl about to be initiated and uh, it's it just, it's, you know, anyway, you don't wanna know what would happen to these kids after these scenes, you know, in this basement. So it was one of those abusive cults that was against the law. It was outlawed, that's what I would say, outlawed uh, by the Roman government and each city was, the government was tried to stamp it out, but they, they hid, of course, they were, this is all in a basement where no one was admitted unless they were known to be members of that cult. So they had, you know, a front where they just said, oh, we just have musicians, you know, and people cooking stuff and normal parties, you know, regular Roman orgies among consenting adults. That was a fine, of course, with the Romans. Uh, and for that, you see things like this, you know, what's left of this here that's missing the top part. Uh, or here's a, probably a slave, maybe not, but probably dancing for some of the other people, a musician here, or maybe a couple of them. Uh, and then upper class, it was almost all upper class families that were members of this cult. And sadly, they often in, in forced their own children to participate in these uh, abusive rituals. I won't go into any more detail than that, but you get the idea. This was such a reprehensible uh, or objectionable um, type of uh, behavior by even the liberal Roman standards that it was against the law to be a member. And the Roman government uh, tried to uh, stamp it out, wipe it out. Uh, I, I don't think they ever did. Anyway, here in Pompeii, they didn't because this existed, this, this uh, room and the, and the activities in it, this cult continued to use this basement for these horrible rituals up until the explosion of Mount Vesuvius. As you all know, it's part of the meaning you could add as the last part that uh, this city, Pompeii, was buried by a volcanic eruption. It was about 30 years later. We can just say a few decades later. And of course, rediscovered about, oh, 250 years ago, you get to say in the 1700s by archeologists, which they're still digging sections of the city out. If you get to Italy and you have time to go anywhere outside of Rome, Florence and Venice, the three main tourist attractions, go south, it takes you a whole day to get there, to Naples, you have to write this now, which is the big city that's there now. And just on the other side of Mount Vesuvius, are the ruins of Pompeii. That will give you an accurate picture of what life was like in ancient Rome because they've excavated and restored in many places, hundreds and hundreds of houses left buried, of course, under lava, but that isn't what killed the people. You don't have to know this. It, it, the lava came days later. They were all dead by then. It was the gas, the poisonous gas. It literally suffocated the people. And then if that didn't do it, the ash, that came within a few hours. The lava moved very slowly as lava does and eventually buried everything and solidified, of course, over the top of what was once a great Roman city of 50,000 people. Okay, now we'll wrap it up with a formal analysis and then take a break. This is balance. If you were to stand here and look at the two panels, but you can't tell from this picture, so you just have to write that. Um, you know, there's a roughly even number of figures on either side of this long section and on either of the two end sections. You can't see the other section, I, the photographer, this is not my photo, who took the picture was standing, of course, in front of it. So it was completely symmetrical. The room itself was rectangular, of course, and the walls were evenly uh, adorned with figures. And of course, it's superb. The Romans were the best fresco painters in the ancient world, and here's the proof. Look at the expressions in this poor child about to get it. Doesn't know what's gonna happen to him sure when I was there, it was a girl, but I can't remember for sure. Uh, in any case, they, they, they were equal opportunity abusers of young children, um, sadly. Okay, you see the expression, see, doesn't this woman look like she's disapproving? She's a servant, might be her daughter, who knows, or she just knows what's about to happen. So there's powerful expressions and emotions here. The Romans were master painters. Uh, they were the best in the ancient world, uh, at least the Western ancient uh, cultures as fresco painters. And then we have the colors. This is Pompeii red. They invented that color, which then reappears after the rediscovery of Pompeii it was used. Why would they the show the servants disgust? I thought this was a pro uh, Dionysus cult. Yes. 
Yes. Good. Qu again, excellent questions. Yes. Good point. And guess what? The artist wasn't a member of the cult. Um, the artist was probably sworn to secrecy and maybe even with on pain of death, probably someone who had some reason why they had to keep their mouth quiet shut. And I'm guessing, the, you know, it's a little like the thing with the uh, dying lioness in, in a vague, mm -hmm. similar sense. An artist who disapprove of what they were observing, but couldn't openly state that. So they make this scene, which... Some of the people in the room might have guessed that that was he was the stay was you know it was a man or a woman that painted this. Oh, it could have been even a small group of artists, but they would have been sworn to secrecy and, and perhaps even um, you know pain of quite literally of death or imprisonment. Of course, if you were a slave or or or, or just a poor person in ancient Rome, you had no rights. Well, you might have a few rights if you owned a small bakery or something, you know, but in any case, whoever uh, painted this, I think, no, it's my educated guess, I can't prove it, but it sure looks like she's not enjoying what she's seeing just behind her shoulder there, and she's clearly a servant, and these are the rich, powerful people that were members of that uh, cult. Okay, let's wrap it up with the formal analysis, uh, finishing, oh, space. There's overlapping of the figures. There, there really, I don't see much. Let me see, maybe there's a little foreshortening here. I guess there's a little bit on the bodies of some of the figures. Yeah, we're really only on this man who's reclining. So there's minimal foreshortening, mostly overlapping, though the Romans could do well with, with uh, other space techniques. Here, there's only those two. The, the masses are almost all the same. The adult figures, the, uh, the females and the males are about the same height and, and same uh, size. So there's a lot of, and of course that creates the rhythm of the human bodies, the arms, hands, legs. Uh, I already said the cement texture, superb on and done with painted line. Of course, there's no carved line. Painted line, which creates the realistic cement texture of hair, clothing, skin. Again, we'll, we'll uh, let's go up here a little bit closer. Yeah, look at his hair there, how well done that is. And his robes. Yeah, um, and let's see, modeling, of course, also modeling in, in a Roman fresco would always be strong and realistic or sharp realistic modeling. Uh, especially on the human figures' uh, faces, but also on their clothing. Uh, and uh, let's see, obviously I mentioned, oh, dynamic versus stable, then we'll, we'll take our break. I, I would call this uh, mostly stable. Look carefully. Most of the figures are walking or standing upright, except in this section here. Even this dancer really is. Uh, so it's more stable than dynamic, but there are some dynamic details. And at least uh, one of the main figures, maybe this guy as well, are, are leaning over. So a few of the figures are dynamic. All right, let's take a 15 minute break. So let's call it uh, 822. Okay, 15 minutes is 807. I'll see you guys in a 15 minutes. Hello. Everybody, welcome back. Uh, I, I probably should have said before the break, uh, you guys that are here now with with the rest of us are uh, going to be better off if the people who couldn't stay, they can watch, of course, the recording after 7 p.m. on Friday. But uh, among the remaining slides for tonight, uh, we'll probably do about four must knows. There are two, which uh, I guarantee at least one of them will be on the slide essay part of the midterm because they're both so important and you can guess what they might be at least one of them the Colosseum, really important and pa the pantheon so we're going to get to those but first we are going to i'm going to uh, go past this and get to get to those important ones we'll get to this next week because there's no like i said absolute set order here i just uh want to move on to those that are let's see all right, this one I will uh, talk about. It's a different kind of a fresco. So here we go. It's on tonight's list from week six, about halfway down, cityscape. One word, just like it sounds, cityscape. The location is a city in Italy, Boscoriale. B-O-S-C-O-R-E-A-L-E, -E, Boscoriale. And the date is 25 BC or BCE. So it's a fresco on the wall of a country villa of a wealthy Roman. And we know enough about him to know he also had a city villa 
And it's illustrated here on the wall of his country villa. And as one of my uh, former students uh, said, that means he wasn't very Zen. He, he was where he was supposed to be. He was thinking, in other words, when he was in the country, he was thinking about the luxuries he had at his urban villa, which we're going to talk about all these luxurious details. They were amazing in this painting. But when he was in his luxurious urban villa in the city of Rome, he had a painting on the wall of his country villa, and he was thinking about how nice the peaceful, quiet countryside is. So, uh, in other words, he, you know, he obviously would have perhaps had uh, <clears throat> someone paint these two different scenes to remind him, perhaps even if nothing else, how wealthy he was. Of course, he would have had to be to have even one villa, let alone one in the city or one in the country. So he was upper class, clearly, perhaps even a nobleman. All right, so why do we say he had a fancy or luxurious urban villa? Well, it's painted here on the wall of his country villa. So let's go up close. There are several things here that only the wealthiest Roman families could afford. First of all, the doors to his Roman villa, you want to say Roman, you know, that can be misinterpreted. I mean, city villa in Rome are bronze solid bronze that's very expensive especially an ornate bronze set of doors he would have had to hire the most you know skilled craftsmen to do that and then the actual wall behind it is marble okay and then he had a marble column out front of his villa just for decorative purposes along the street <laughs> Uh, so he could show off to passers-by, and it's got real gold. Can you tell that that's, it's called gilt, G-I-L-T. You don't have to worry about the spelling of that word, but it's part of the meaning that he's showing off his wealth with this fresco in every detail, uh, at least in the foreground. And the marble column itself would be expensive, of course. A column out of marble that's tall, or this tall would be a lot of money. And then on top of that, he has it decorated with these bas-relief, of course, is what they are, um, carvings. And they are painted gold. And then the most surprising detail of all is this. That is a window with glass. There was very little glass in windows in the ancient world. The Egyptians had glass for bottles and, and uh, you know, cups and, and various kinds of containers. Uh, the Greeks had a glass also for similar purposes, you know, maybe a little larger things like a vase or uh, uh, some other larger <clears throat> contain wine bottles and so forth. But it was the Romans who started using glass in windows, but only the wealthiest people could afford it. It was a very, very rare material. And that's another way of showing off his wealth. Okay, but what's going on behind him? That's the background in the hill above. You, if you can't tell, that's supposed to be on a hill above the neighborhood where his this wealthy Roman's urban villa was was a hill, which actually is called the Palatine. You don't have to know that name. You can just say a, a, a neighborhood on a hill above his neighborhood, looking down on it. It includes this structure, the Circus Maximus. So that is clearly a detail that he wanted in this painting. That was where the chariot races were conducted, as some of you may know. If you, There was a new version of Ben-Hur, and it wasn't very good. The old one was still better. But anyway, but yeah, it doesn't matter. The point is, you've heard about it. And it's true. They didn't make that up in any version of that movie or in the novel it was written that those movies were based on. The Roman chariot races were deadly. <laughs> Quite often, you know, if you lost, it's because you died in the process of having your chariot cut to pieces by your opponents. So those kind of chariot races were held, and this was the largest public amphitheater uh, uh, in Rome. You might think it was a Colosseum, but we'll, we'll explain how that compares when we get to that slide. So just say it was the largest public amphitheater you know, outdoor entertainment venue, that's what we would say today, uh, in all of Rome. Uh, it could hold anywhere from 150 to 250. In other words, everybody that lives in the city of Santa Rosa today could fit at the same time into this building easily and maybe with room to spare. So he wants to show off his neighborhood is, you know, within sight of this famous structure that was known to the whole Roman Empire. Anybody who went to Rome would want to go see, you know, one of those chariot races. Okay, that's most of the meaning, but there's one other aspect. Look at the way these structures in the city, 
you know, scape, and that's what it is, the view of the neighborhood behind his house, are jumbled, are not lined up, or not correctly aligned, however you want to write that, they are not accurately depicted in terms of space. So this artist was as skilled as any Roman painter of frescoes in terms of the details, we'll get to the formal house in just a minute. But he didn't know, I'm assuming it was probably a man, most likely, we don't know, but usually you know, fresco painters were usually men. Uh, in any case, the point is whoever the painter was, was skilled in every uh, aspect of uh, realistic uh, depiction of uh, a scene except depth and space. The only technique, so now let's do the form analysis. Why do we say that? Well, when it comes to space, all he's used here is overlapping and diminishing size. Even foreshortening is not really used here. Look carefully, I don't see, it's not accurate if it is. It might be a hint of it here. So you could say there's minimal foreshortening in a couple of spots, but it's mostly only overlapping. And of course, the obviously this is smaller than it would be, you know, if it was closer. So there is diminishing size, uh, but it does not have uh, accurate depictions of, uh, of foreshortening, let alone, of course, the other techniques that didn't exist yet, like um, <clears throat> scientific perspective, but the Romans knew atmospheric perspective and a view this far away, a mile, that, that building would have had been a mile away easily. That hill was way back behind the neighborhood that this house would have been in. Uh, and it, you know, would have crowned the top of the hill, would have a blue misty look to it. But this artist didn't know how to use those techniques. So it's not realistic. Let's do the form analysis now. This painting is not very skilled or realistic in terms of its use of, of uh, depiction of depth or space. The only techniques I already said, I'll repeat that though, are overlapping and diminishing size really. And, and maybe a little bit of foreshortening on this one balcony, for instance. I don't even see it anywhere else, uh, possibly the, the entry on a gate there. And then we have everything else as well, the, the similar texture on the marble, on the bronze, on the glass, on the gold. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, this is wood, by the way. They did use wood in some parts of Rome. It's not the typical building material in Italy. Uh, it doesn't last as long in their harsh weather, but the hot, you know, damp climate, it's usually stone and brick that was used in plaster, but that's wood. So that has some you know, texture. So that's well done. And the modeling is strong and realistic. Uh, everything is done with uh, painted line and I don't see bold outline, it's all thin outline. Um, it is dynamic. There's the only thing stable really, uh, well, the edge of the entry gate, yeah. And the door frame. Yeah, so you could say that the entry way is, is stable, but and that column, but everything behind it is, well, it's all jumbled up, but it's a diagonal line. So of course you could say it's stable again. And re well, it is stable on the upper part where the uh, circus, just like it sounds, circus maximus with an X is shown, those columns are upright. But then of course the whole structure has a diagonal line to it. So the upper portion is a mixture of stable dynamic. The foreground is mostly stable. The largest mass, that's hard to say. I'd say it's the entryway, this section here. And then the column, but maybe it's the column because the column's so tall. You can decide that for yourself. And then the third largest would definitely be the uh, amphitheater, the Circus Maximus. Uh, the colors warm on the entryway, absolutely. You know, gold and bronze and red marble. It's quite, you know, strong earth tones. And then we have the off-white color of this stone and plaster on the uh, rest of the buildings until you get up to the amphitheater and then it's warm again. It's kind of a pink, I think that was marble too, pinkish marble on the columns. And then um, let's see, what do we, oh, uh, balance. It's roughly balanced, I think. Um, now nobody's asked about this figure here. See that? That is the Greek tragedy mask, right? which is symbolic of the uh, fact that this guy probably loved drama and he might even have had a small stage in his uh, private theater in his country and perhaps both his urban and country villa. In any case, he liked to go to plays, if not in his own house. Um, it's interesting. Let's see it that, why he put that there. Um, all right, I think that's, yeah, enough on this one. Let's see. Of course, there's the rhythm of the repeated shapes of the of the uh, columns and the windows and the uh, details on the door there. 
All right, uh, now we get to the Colosseum. Very important slide. And so those people that uh, are missing this, well, hopefully they'll see it on YouTube soon because this is, this is one that I said just a few minutes ago is one of the two remaining slides for tonight's must know slides that this or not both, but one or the other, the Pantheon are definitely one of the two is gonna be on the midterm. I think most of you know certain facts about it. Again, Colosseum is C-O-L-O-S-S-E-U-M. Location is, of course, Rome, and the date is 80 AD. Most people know some of these facts, but if you're not sure, sure of them or you never, you know, study this period of history, you should be writing. This first fact is that it was the site of gladiatorial combat, or you could just say gladiator combat, uh, between armed men who were slaves. And if you didn't see the Russell Crowe movie Gladiator, if this period interests you and that phenomena of Roman culture and history interests you, you can't see a better movie than that. It's excellent. Joaquin Phoenix is the corrupt emperor, right? And uh, I forget his name now, the guy that played Dumbledore, <laughs> the original, right? Uh, Harry Potter movies plays the emperor, Joaquin Phoenix's father, who was a real person, uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was an, a superb emperor. And then it, the, the son was just as corrupt and cruel as the character Joaquin Phoenix's plays in that movie. Uh, in any case, this Colosseum was the largest uh, open air. Okay, now here's what you have to say. Uh, you can say blood sport site or combat site. Obviously, I said the largest period of any open air uh, stadium would have been the Circus Maxis, which is a few miles away. It's in total ruins. This is amazingly well preserved. Some of you said you were there, as I recall, in your mini bios, and not there, but had been to Italy. Well, anyway, if you go, you're never going to forget the experience of looking up at this. So let's get up a little closer to it. And look at the small, that, that's a city bus with, you know, 60 people on board or seats for 60. Look how it's dwarfed. This could hold between 50, sort of the facts you stand, between 50 and 70,000 people could fit inside this Colosseum. There's a debate and the conservative, you know, cautious historians uh, hew towards the lower end of the range. But what they're not counting or adding into their calculation is there was a lot of cheap standing room only space. You can't say seats because standing room ain't seats, right? So when you add standing room only capacity, plus all the people that worked at the Coliseum, you know, and we'll talk about who some of those people were in just a minute. And the performers, there were as many as two or 3,000 performers kept below the floor of the Coliseum during performances, not just gladiators, but all kinds of other blood sports. And if you don't know what those were, I'll give you a couple examples. Lions versus Christians, that's almost a cliche, but it's true, that did happen. But there were many more other kinds of animal versus human contests, which almost always ended in the humans losing. And there was, of course, also torture. Yes, literally, just torture of people burned to death or slowly, you know, um, hacked to death, usually Christians, but they often were other minority groups that were uh, taken as prisoners one way or another and then subject to a slow, painful death to entertain crowds of bloodthirsty Roman citizens, of course. The games were free, by the way. Uh, and that's one of the way the Roman emperors, they paid for them. They were free to the citizens. Uh, the emperor and his family would pay for them to curry favor with the masses. And then the other thing that some of you may not know is they had the stage, sorry, the floor of the stadium was flooded every so often. And they would have mock naval battles, <laughs> if you could imagine that. You know, wooden ships, if I say small, you'll think I'm talking about miniatures. No, the ships with dozens of people or a dozen or so maybe on each ship, which would attack each other and try to kill each other's crews and sink each other's ships. Mock naval battles were held here. It's a remarkable um, set of, you know, things that occurred here and rather, of course, grim because they were all blood sports. Now, it was... For space, when I said 50 to 70,000, that includes standing room. I think it's closer to 70. That's, whoops, let's wait till my internet connection stabilizes. Hang on. 
Okay, stable again. All right, so there is evidence that the Colosseum was, um, when it was new, okay, it was 160, and it still is, the parts of it that, that it's like three quarters of it remaining, or two thirds, sorry, two thirds of it is remaining standing. Why the one third is one third is missing, I'll get to in a minute. So it was 160 feet high. That's the equivalent of 16 story building. Each section was 40 feet high. Well, you can do the math, 40 times four, 160 feet total height. That itself is remarkable that it was that tall. So it was the tallest public structure in Rome, period. Oh, not public, the tallest structure period in all of Rome. I don't often say that, but it clearly was. The second tallest you're gonna see in the next slide, uh, which is the other one that may be, or uh, one of the two that will definitely be on the exam. Okay, why is there about a third of it missing? There might be another view, I can't remember. No, there isn't yet. There are several views of this. Well, the reason is that the uh, later Pope, just say uh, several hundred years ago, oh, the, right, the right word is during the Renaissance, right? 1500s, however you want to write that, Renaissance, 1500s, 500 years ago, stole, there's no other word for it, stole the stones from the outer wall of the Colosseum to build St. Peter's, the largest church in the world. So just doing the math, if the largest church on earth, it still is, St. Peter's in Rome, could be built from barely one third of the stones of this structure, leaving the other two thirds in place. This was a massive mountain, a man-made mountain, quite literally. Uh, it'd probably be the second largest structure on earth at that time in terms of mass or volume, you know, weight, after the Great Pyramid, of course, that we already talked about in ancient uh, Egypt. Okay, so let's finish up with how did they maintain it? I said there were people uh, who worked there and, oh, it was well over a thousand. Well, they had a contingent of soldiers, the estimates are 800 to 1,000, just of soldiers permanently stationed there to not just guard the place and keep, you know, the performers in their place and, and you know, mobs and thugs from rioting, and that could have had, probably did happen a few times. The point is to keep order. They had that purpose, but they also protected the spectators during rain. It rains a lot in Rome in the summer, and these games were 12 months a year they would have them. And so to cover the Colosseum, they had a giant, uh, some of you know this, right, a stitched set of animal hides, and then later they th that didn't work so well, so they used uh, uh, a kind of fabric, we'll just say, you know, they had a dome they could cover this with. The dome implies it's rounded, so I probably shouldn't use that word. They had a stitched uh, tarpaulin, there's a good word, gigantic tarpaulin, that those soldiers, <clears throat> when they were stationed here, they would climb to the top of these parapets. Of course, there was you know, stairs and, and, and balconies, and they would pull on ropes till they had this entire space covered with this giant tarpaulin. And it would be a canvas, that's it, it was canvas, yeah. They started out using animal hides, but those deteriorated in the weather too easily. So they switched to using canvas. So just say a canvas cover. There we go. That's a simple way to keep it. That could be pulled across the entire space, except for a 20 foot hole in the middle. They'd leave that because these were all daytime events, of course, not evening events. The sun could still get through there enough that they could see. In other words, no event, no blood sport, no sacrifice, torture, murder, combat, whatever bloodletting would ever be halted on account of weather. So if you were someone praying to God or the gods to, to spare you another day by having a rainstorm come along and stop the events, you're out of luck. <laughs> because all it do is delay it 20 minutes. That's how long it took for them to pull that giant uh, canvas tarp over the top. Pretty amazing. They figured that system out. And it's still better than the ones at the stadiums that have retractable roofs like Toronto's stadium, the baseball stadium in Toronto. I sat there and watched them put that roof. It took them 45 minutes to get their mechanical roof to cover over in a rainstorm. These, these people had that time down to half, 20 minutes, and then the games would resume. Okay, formal analysis. I already said the space, but let me repeat that. 
it, the real space is 160 feet tall and it could hold up to just say up to 70,000 people inside. And then we have, of course, it's a cool color. If you look at the stone, it's a very uh, off white color. Uh, there is a brick lining the inside, but that's not what you see in this picture. So just say the, from this photo, it's a cool uh, whitish gray or grayish white color. It, the rhythm is very strong here with the arches and the columns, right? Uh, and then is it dynamic or stable? It's both because each of the piers, and these are piers, remember we mentioned that term with the slide of Pont de Garde aqueduct, and the columns themselves, right, are stable, but it's more dynamic because all of these arches and the whole building is, of course, an oval shaped. Uh, you could say circular if you prefer, but it's actually an oval. Um, and then there is no larger or smaller mass. All four levels are 40 feet high, so they're four equal masses. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, the, the rhythm is obvious. I think I said that with the, each of the arches in this uh, columns lining these arches between them and the piers that support the weight of everything above. And then we have uh, texture, the real rough texture of stone. There's no cementated texture. And the modeling is just the shadows from the sun and there is visual line under each of the arches. When it was new, last but not least, it would have been totally balanced left to right and top to bottom. Uh, but now it's weighted toward, in this photo, it'd be toward the left because you see this section on the right end is, is the edge of the part that was stolen by a past pope, uh, taken away for use on another building. Okay, now we get to one of the other two. So you can count on either that last slide or this one being on the midterm. So you really want to take extra thorough notes, not cutting either of them from the study list when we do the review next week. You, you want to be in the class next week for that. It's the second half. I know I understand people getting tired, but you know, I, I do the three hour lectures. So yeah, uh, you guys should not uh, stick with it. Of course, I'm preaching the choir. You guys are all here, but it, I'll say this in an email. It's important for everyone to stick with, it, unless there's some unavoidable reason they have to drop out at the break, because otherwise you won't have a chance to ask questions and know more uh, detailed instructions or advice on how to study for the midterm and how it's going to be uh, given and graded. And I'm going to cut the study list down by at least 30%, maybe 40% in class. And of course, people can watch the video of it, but then there won't be a chance to ask questions. So hopefully all of you guys here now will stick through the end of next week's too to help you out in preparation for the uh, midterm. Okay, here we go. The next must know Pantheon, one word. P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N. -E the location, of course, Rome, and the date of this is 125 AD. So what do we have here? We have the largest dome building ever built in ancient Rome, in the ancient Roman Empire, actually. So I'll repeat that. This was the largest domed building ever built in the Roman Empire, and it's still standing. Now is it standing? It's still functioning for similar purposes to for which it was built. It still functions as a church. It's now a Catholic church, but originally it was a Roman temple. And of course that obviously is a religious site. It was the temple to all the gods. That's what the word means, pantheon means you go inside here and whichever God you came to pray to or ask a favor or help from, you could do that. Most temples were dedicated to only one God and that's the only one you could go there and pray to. This one was one of those temples where every God had equal, you know, uh, billing, <laughs> equal access. I mean, or, or you, or your visiting here gave you equal access to any Roman God or gods, plural, if you felt like praying to more than one. Uh, it was open to the public 24 hours a day. The dome, when I said it's the largest dome building in, ancient, in the ancient world, I think I do have, yeah, I do. Look at this. That should look awfully modern to some of you. It, it, that is a 2,000 year old piece of concrete. Well, it's not one piece. It's a bunch of sections laid over several years. Not a crack in it. That's the original 2,000 year old dome. And they've had earthquakes and floods and uh, lightning and fires and you know, pollution <laughs> and plagues, uh, you know, wars, bombing. 
right? During World War II, this is amazing that it survived intact like that. And yes, there's a hole, I'll explain why as part of the meeting. But first, let's just talk about the dome. The dome is one of the two things the Romans invented that are on your list that you should know, uh, you know, what's on that list. You don't have to write definitions, I told you already, but the first two items, this building uses concrete to create a dome. Two things, both of which were invented by the Romans. So uh, how big is the dome? It is, and here's another view of it from the inside. Look at that, 144 feet. You could just say over 140 feet to keep it simple, but it's actually 144 feet tall by uh, about the same width, over 140 feet wide by 144 feet tall. That's, you could fit a 14-story skyscraper inside this building. And why is there a, a, a hole around opening in the ceiling. That's so the gods could see you and you could see them, supposedly. In other words, if you're praying, you want to look up towards where you think the gods would be, right? And they could then hear or see you down below. Now, this, if you can tell by the clothing, is much, is like in the 1700s. These are people visiting. It was a tourist attraction from the day it opened right on through till today. Believe me, there are busloads of people every few minutes get out and come through this building. You're lucky if you can find it when it's not crowded. Get up early in the morning. That's what I did. If you if you get to Rome and you want to see this, it will blow your mind when you know what you're looking at. For instance, the ceiling is half the weight of any other dome ceiling of this uh, uh, size in, in Rome. I mean, not this size, I meant in Rome. I'll say it again. The ceiling is roughly half or about half the weight of uh, any other dome ceiling proportionately to other domes because other domes had not thought to do this or had not been created with this idea. They indented these are called coffers. Let's go up close, coffers. And that lightens the weight of the dome itself so it doesn't collapse in on itself. And it also strengthens the actual dome because these are each, you know, sort of strong points that they'll, it's, it's engineering, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, I've never studied it, but you don't have to be an engineer to understand the general idea behind it, which is just that the Roman engineering was the best ever known to the human race up to that time. And we still haven't figured out how they made their concrete because there is not a building, including the new Bay Bridge, right? Some of you know this, the first big earthquake over 8.0, it's going to collapse. It's a joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. We spent $7 billion on that and it's already rusting. You know that the piers of that bridge, if you don't know that, you can look it up online. Right after it opened, there was already problems with the bridge uh, starting to have rust and um, failures that, you know, it's just, it's sad. Anyway, <laughs> that's obviously one way of looking at things. The Romans were better at building long lasting structures than modern architects or modern builders, let's just say modern culture uh, in most cases. Um, they knew what they were doing, how to figure out the height, the width, the texture of the concrete, and then these kind of details, indenting the interior of the dome so it was uh, much lighter than it would otherwise be. Now, the last thing to say about the meaning is it never floods. You might, some of you have thought this, right? wait a minute, what about when it rains? I just said it rains a lot in Rome, as you can imagine. It rains like cats and dogs or whatever phrase you want to use. Heavy rainstorms can come out of nowhere, especially in the summer, and flood the streets. You know, I don't mean flood like, you know, five foot high waves, but you know, up over your sandals. <laughs> I know, I've seen it. So how come this building doesn't flood when it's got an open hole in the middle? Because of the engineering, the floor is tilted ever so subtly actually it's a foot from the crown or center they call this of the floor to the walls and there are open uh, openings that lead you know of course with conduits there we go again down to the river you know the river that runs through rome so the water drains it never ponds or floods inside this building and i've been inside this building when it rained heavily and it was remarkable i mean you get a little light little bit of you know water as it passes by your the bottom of your Gucci's or whatever you're wearing, but you don't ever get flooding inside this building ever. And last but not least, see these doors here? Let's go up here. These are the original 25 foot tall bronze doors. And they have, this is the last fact about the meaning now, and then we'll do a formal analysis. They have the original lock on them set into the doors 
of course, at this level. I've watched this happen in the morning. I got there before it opened. As like I said, I wanted to see this happen. And the original lock is still works it still opens these doors every morning it's been kept at the vatican under safe you know keeping of course it's a national treasure the actual original lock still works on the original i mean key works inside the original lock no wd-40 needed now that's building for the ages okay let's go back to do the formal analysis because if it's on the test you'll be this to you okay it's completely symmetrical as most roman buildings were of course um, and yet you could say it's weighted a little in terms of balance, left to right, it's totally balanced. It's a little bit unbalanced toward the bottom because of course the dome gets narrower as you go up. Uh, then we have the rhythm of the columns and the carved letters. That's the only carved line here. Otherwise the line's all visual line as most buildings have around the edges. And there is strong modeling because of the deep recessed portico. Remember the term portico would come in handy as I mentioned during the Greek lecture. Uh, they invented the idea of right, column porches on front of a building. So underneath the portico is deep shadows. That's where most of the modeling is. And of course, it's not a technique. It's the real shadows from the sun. And these are carved lines. That, by the way, says who the architect was. His name was Marcus Agrippa, built this structure. Uh, and then we have the color. It's warm on the uh, brick walls, but you can't tell that that well in this slide. Let me see, maybe it's more obvious. Yeah, you sort of can, that's warm brick, but that's after they stripped the marble. Another Pope, different Pope, stole the marble off the outside of this building to build like three or four other churches. The concrete is cool. It's always been that color. There's no change to the dome. So the walls now are warm on the uh, outer, most of the outer walls because of the red brick. Cool, of course, on the off-white uh, marble portico and obviously cool on, again, the off-white dome. The largest structure, well, let's see, or mass, I'm sorry. It's the outer walls, then the dome, and then the portico. You can see from this angle, so you just need to write it that way. Okay, and then we have for space, I mentioned it's all real space. Those columns are 46 feet tall, by the way. But you can just say there's a portico with columns over 45 feet tall, and the space inside has a dome 144 feet tall and over 140 feet wide. Okay, and the rhythm is obvious with the repeated shapes of the columns and the layers of concrete there uh, and the lettering. Uh, and let's see, texture is the real smooth texture of marble and concrete on the portico and the dome and the real rough texture of brick on the outer walls. Okay. <clears throat> And so we have, let's do just two more slides and we're gonna end significantly early today around maybe nine, 10 or so. But these next two, I'm only gonna say that uh, I might cut one of them from the study list, but not both of them. So we're just leaving it at that. There's a good chance and it's not as certain as the last two, one of those for sure, as I already said, will be on the midterm. But uh, either of these two have, have a, a possibility, a strong possibility. Okay, this is the next month. So is the Arch of Titus. That's T-I-T-U-S. Arch of Titus. He was a Roman emperor. Rome, of course, and the date is 81 AD. Now, some of you might know the history of this arch. If you're Jewish or have Jewish family, friends, relatives, as, as, as I do, I'm not Jewish, but I have a lot of Jewish friends and I grew up with Jewish neighbors all, all over Chicago when I was a kid. Uh, I knew about this event. This is a triumphal arch. So yes, we do have one last definition. I have to admit, I forgot that that was from this week. I apologize. It's a short definition and you see where it is underneath aqueducts on your list of terms, okay? A triumphal arch is a large stone archway built to commemorate a Roman, or just say millet, not Roman, sorry, a built to commemorate a military victory, comma, beneath which the soldiers who won that victory would march. I'll say it again. A triumphal arch, the Romans invented it, of course, it's on that list, uh, was a large stone archway built to commemorate a military victory, comma, 
beneath which the soldiers who won that victory would march. Of course, it was for a ceremony. And then afterwards, from then on, it would be every year on the anniversary, you know, of that battle. There'd be you know, reenactment and there'd be, you know, celebration and the soldiers, would, the ones that were still alive would march underneath it. Okay, are there triumphal arches in the world today? Of course, uh, there's the one in uh, Paris, the biggest in the world, right? That Napoleon had built. The Arch of Triumph. There's uh, one in New York City. It's, it's in every movie, every rom com, and half the TV shows filmed in New York. Uh, Friends, for instance, used to meet there. You know, it's it's famous. It's 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 in Greenwich Village in New York. So there are triumphal arches today, and they're all based on the original Roman idea. So what did this arch commemorate? What victory? The fall of Jerusalem. So here are the main facts about the meaning. To the Roman army, a few years earlier, it actually took a while to build this arch because Titus was at first just the general who defeated the Jews. They rebelled against the Romans. And unfortunately for them, they lost. They held out for years. I think it was three years. You could just say after several years of fighting, uh, the Jews were expelled from Israel. And that's the beginning of the diaspora, or some say diaspora, the wandering of the Jews around the world. They were kicked out of their homeland and the Arab tribes that lived around what was then the colony, the Roman colony of Israel, then became, of course, an Arab territory ruled by the Romans. In other words, the roots of the Arab-Israeli conflict, I do not take sides and it's so complex. I can see both sides in that. But in any case, whatever your opinion, that's your business. It exists, we know. It's, it's Some people say the reason for 9-11 was this very conflict. Its roots go back, and I'm gonna prove that to you, to this day. Look at what's inside. This is chilling when you know what you're looking at. This is the moment Jerusalem fell and the images in this are so, so, what's the word, powerful and so specific, that's what I'm looking for, that we don't have to guess. When the Roman soldiers had finally wiped out all of the Israeli, you know, Jewish soldiers, and they uh, expelled the women and children, and the older men and the men that escaped had left. In other words, when the city was completely abandoned uh, to the Jewish people, they had been killed or, or, or left they sacked the city. There's no other word for that. So this is a depiction of the sacking of Jerusalem. They stole everything in sight. Some of you know what this is, but if not, you, I'll spell for you, a menorah, a seven-headed candelabra, right? Which is a sacred object for Jewish ritual rituals, uh, religious rituals, I should say. And so they stole the largest of, these are from the temple. The, the big build, the base building in Jerusalem was there their temple, of course, where they held so many of their ceremonies when they were an independent kingdom. And then even for a while, the Romans let them do that until they rebelled. So they destroyed the temple, which is why there's only one wall of it left now, which is called the Wailing Wall. And some of you know about this. It's the holiest site to Jews around the world. It's all that's left of this after these soldiers destroyed most of the temple and stole everything inside. So that's what this depicts, the sacking of Jerusalem with the Roman soldiers. They're not wearing armor because they've already killed everybody that was resisting them. So it's probably a night or two or three after the fall. But this object here is a subject of debate, but most historians think it's a very mystical object that in the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark is depicted by Spielberg, as you may know, he's Jewish. And he is fascinated by the history of this period, as you might know, if you've watched his Indiana Jones movies. The Ark of the Covenant disappeared that night from the Jewish temple of Jerusalem, and no one knows where it is. There are rumors that it appeared during the Middle Ages in this kingdom and that, but this is just rumors. No one knows what happened to it. It, it is a real thing. Now, wh whether it had magic powers, uh, that's a matter of personal belief or lack of it. Uh, you, you decide. Uh, but I'm not talking about the um, myths about it. I'm talking about the real object. It existed. It had pieces of the Ten Commandments inside it. It was the most sacred object to the Jews in their most sacred place, their temple. It was stolen that night. It was, after all, it was gold. And who knows? The Romans could have melted it down and just thrown the pieces of the you know, tablets from the, the Ten Commandments. We don't know. All you have to write is this, that every uh, valuable object that Roman soldiers could get their hands on, including gold and 
and uh, you know candelabras or, or sacred objects you could just say including the ark of the covenant was stolen that night from the temple and then the temple itself was destroyed by the soldiers uh during this 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 uh pill you could say pillage if you prefer but the word most people use for that kind of attack when you destroy everything after you conquer a city is, is sack s-a-c-k not to be confused with an object <laughs> it's an act okay you get the idea this was the root of the arab israeli conflict is, is that night because right after that event the Roman the local governor invited the, the tribes living around what would then have been the outer edges of Jerusalem and, and Israel to move into that territory because the Jews have been kicked out. So echoes of history 2000 years later, we still are dealing with it this night, that event. And that's the illustration right there we just looked at, right? Well, it's one, actually it's the other side. It's on this side here, the one we just looked at. So the top part is later. That's part of the meaning. This was added by another, you know, popes and their egos. What can I say? I can say that I'm a lapsed Catholic. Anyway, there aren't all egotistical, but they, the ones in the Renaissance were. They always had the best artists building tombs for them and fancy statues and churches. This is a later pope who wanted his name on top of this monument. So the Roman monument ends here. You see that where the arrow is. Okay, so this was totally symmetrical. It still is, really. It's missing a few chips stone but it is it's balanced left to right and clearly unbalanced toward the top that's kind of an odd concept isn't it that, you know wait a minute things if they're unbalanced top to bottom they'd always be heavier on the bottom obviously not with an archway so what about space it's the real well there are two aspects there is the real space of a 50 foot high archway with about a four uh, sorry 50 foot high monument i'm sorry to the top of it with about a 40 foot high archway you can tell by the people standing here right and then we have the rhythm of the columns and the carved uh, angels and soldiers. You saw them here. There, there is uh, overlapping on, uh, I didn't see any, let's go to that, another view again, of the, or, uh, the same view. I don't see any foreshortening here. So it's just overlapping of the figures inside the archway is a technique for space. There's carved line to create the similar texture on the Roman soldiers. And also that's not, remember that's not part of the original, so ignore this. Uh, carved line for the outer edges you know, of the decorative details, the columns and the, uh, a, those are angels, victory angels uh, on either side of the arch. So that's all done with a carved line. There's no painted line. It's a cool off-white color, actually pretty much just grayish white. Modeling is the shadows, natural modeling from the sun. There's no technique for modeling. Um, the texture is the real smooth texture of marble and uh, uh, Semi texture on the Roman soldiers, their hair, their clothing, uh, the objects they're stealing. That's that's very realistic and well done. Um, and um, for mass, it's really one mass. You, you could break it down, I suppose, but it's basically a single mass. Okay. Uh, and I already met, oh, it's uh, dynamic on the archway, of course, and stable pretty much on everything on the outer walls. And then the Roman soldiers, some of them are, are moving, you know, diagonally. So some of the soldiers are diagonal, are therefore dynamic, and some are, are stable, upright. Okay. Now I'm going to go, let me see if I want to go back. Okay, here's what we'll do. What do we do? It's 9.07. So I think we're going to end 9.12, 9.15 at the latest. Um, I am going to say the Arapakis because it's, it's one of the most amazing things in Rome, and most Americans never even get there. It's a portrait of the first Roman emperors at a moment in time when Augustus was still the uh, the emperor, but they were all alive and living in his palace because they were all related to him. And I told you something about him, but uh, when you hear my stories about Caligula, it's they're pretty grotesque. <laughs> the, his behavior was, I mean, even by Roman standards. <laughs> The man was insane. So let's just do one more monument. Okay. Um, but that's actually from next week. So hang on. I think I'm going to do one just to wrap up this. Yeah, Arch of Titus is there. That's last week. Um, I, I'm trying to pick one that's closer to the point at which we have now gotten to in our list. 
uh, but it's not really that easy. So let's just do the column of Trujillo, yeah. Then we'll do the Arapakis and the other three, there'll be four next week. And that'll give us plenty of time for both the review for the exam and uh, my slides of Rome. And we'll still end early next week, maybe even, probably even earlier than tonight. So here we go. The last one we're gonna do now is this. It's called the Column of Trajan, or Trajan, some people call it. It's actually at the top of next week's list, but uh, let's go ahead and do it and, and wrap it up with this slide. Column, I think you all know, is C-O-L-U-M-N of Trajan, T-R-A-J-A-N. Location Rome and the date is 113 AD or, or CE. This, whoops, let me wait till the <clears throat> connection stabilizes. So. This is a 130 foot tall marble column. It's the meaning, of course. Can you repeat <laughs> the spelling? Yes, sure. Oh, yeah. Column is C, sure. Uh, C O L U M N of Trajan or Trajan. I've heard it pronounced both ways. The name of a Roman emperor. T R A J A N. Okay. I already said the location, Rome. Now, Thank you. yeah, you're welcome, of course. Uh, this is a 130 foot tall marble column, which has over 5,000 figures carved on a spiral pattern. Can you tell it's spiraling upwards? Now, when I show you my own slides of Rome, I'll have the context. You'll be able to see where these things are and what they look like from like across the street or, you know, looking up. And uh, that's why I think you'll find it interesting. And you won't have to take notes then, of course. Um, but anyway, this is a column, the bottom part of a 130 foot tall column, but it's the closest view you can get. It's eye level. It's what you'd see if you walk right straight up to it and look at it. But it's right at the edge of the Roman Forum and it commemorates one of the last Roman conquests. That's an important detail. What is it commemorating? A victory, of course. It's a victory column. By the way, any victory columns anywhere? Anybody know? Let's see, downtown San Francisco, Union Square. Yeah, that's a controversy now for some people. It's a column commemorating our quote, and it was, what else was it? A conquest of the Philippines, which became a colony, as you probably know in 1898 during the Spanish-American War. Yeah, it's, it's the, I think they call it the Dewey Column because they were the uh, admiral of the uh, US Navy that actually occupied or conquered Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Anyway, so that's a victory column. And then there's victory columns all over the East Coast uh, in Washington and Boston and New York. Yeah, so they're, they're around all, all, all around the world, but the Romans invented this too. However, it's not that important invention. So I put on the list of things to know about inventions by the Romans. So just say this is a Roman idea to commemorate a victory with carved figures. There are over 5,000 of them and you're just looking at a few dozen here. And they're mostly of the soldiers who won the victory. What victory was it? That's the other part of the meaning. It was over Dracula, don't worry this. I started to say Dracula, I shouldn't say it. Anybody knows your geography, perhaps you know Romania, the country of Romania named after this victory was originally a part of Europe where the Romans never went. It was a fierce warlike culture called the Dacians before the Romans conquered them. D, so it's a conquest of Dacia, D-A-C-I-A, -A, Dacia. And the people there were Dacians with an N, of course. What, why did this matter? Because they were the, one of the few uh, barbarian, you know, non-Roman cultures that gave the Roman army a run for their money, however you want to write that, trouble, uh, could defeat them in battle. And for many years, they harassed the Roman soldiers on their border, the border of the empire. So finally, an emperor named Trajan, that's why it's called the Column of Trajan, got tired of that, and he invaded Dacia, and he conquered it, and he added it as the last province, which today, if you look on a map, is the country of Romania. Now, it may not be obvious, so if it isn't, you should write it. The name Romania comes from this. It, they had nothing to do with Rome before that. After the defeat of the Dacians, the Romans did two things. First, they let the people go home if they swore they wouldn't rebel. But they did another time, and then they just massacred the entire population. That's how the Romans did things. And replaced them with Roman citizens who were needing land, you know, farmland or, or homes. They had a homeless problem. They had overcrowding and a housing crisis. 
Rome is a city of two million people. Even now, that's a big city back then. It's, it's just unheard of. No other place on earth came close. So yes, they were overcrowded. And so they wanted living room for their citizens. And they, they, they said, hey, we got free land. We just took it away from the Dagians. They're all dead. <laughs> so you know, they probably offered them you know, some land and maybe some farm animals. So hundreds of thousands of Romans moved to what's now Romania. And it was named that because they were from Rome. They speak a Latin language. Look at the map, that's Eastern Europe. Every other country around there is Slavic, right? Slavic is the name for the whole Eastern part. Russia, Poland, right? Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, even the Greeks, they're Slavic. They speak Slavic languages or alphabets different. Not the Romanians. They have a Western alphabet like ours and their language is Latin based because they're descendants of the ancient Romans who took over their territory when the Dacians were dead. That's another echo of the past 2000 years ago that's still with us. By the way, you obviously wouldn't need to write this. I was being really silly when I said uh, the land of Dracula, but it is. Romania is where there was such a person. You know that he wasn't a vampire, but he did uh, use you know bloody tactics to defeat Turkish invaders. Uh, and other enemies of his. And he really existed. His name was Count Dracula. And he's from that part of, of Europe. Uh, but the main point to remember is that that country now, whoops, I'll wait till one more time. Oh, this will be our last brief instability. There we go. So to wrap up the meeting, these are scenes depicting the Roman invasion and conquest. That's the only way to write it. Of the province of Dacia, or the kingdom, it was a kingdom. Then it became a province after the Romans took it over. And this is Neptune. See, this giant god of the, the waters or the sea and rivers. He wasn't only a god of the ocean. People think he only lived in the ocean. He, he could come up at any time in any body of water, lake, river. So here he is on a river, by the way. You'll have to know it's the biggest river in Europe, the Danube. So he's, he's siding with the Romans. Of course, he's the god they believe in. So they think it's an omen. It's, of course, mythological. Obviously, this didn't happen, I don't think. These Roman soldiers thought they really saw Neptune. But in this image, they're showing Neptune giving them a, a start, you might say, or, or helping them start their invasion. And they're walking on a bridge of boats. They literally created their own temporary bridge of boat decks <laughs> side by side to cross the widest river in Europe to invade Dacia because they had that was their border. So to get into the kingdom of Dacia, they had to cross this huge river. And so they're implying Neptune was helping them. And then up here, they're building a, a siege tower, right? They're going to attack one of the cities. And, and further, there are battle scenes. There's all kinds of events that occurred. It was a two-year-long campaign. So they were a tough enemy. The Romans really had to fight uh, fiercely to defeat them. In fact, twice they had to invade a second time because it, for the first time they thought, well, maybe we should let them you know, stay there because we beat them. But if they just behave themselves, we won't take over their kingdom, but they attacked the Romans border guards again, and that led to their total disappearance. They were wiped out when the Romans took them over the second time. So there's the meaning. Let's wrap it up with a formal analysis, and then I'll stick around for questions if any of you have any. Okay, so this is 130. For space, there are two aspects, the real and the techniques. The real space is it's 130 a um, foot tall column with bas relief figures that are roughly one third life size, about one third life size. Okay, and then we have the techniques here with each of these scenes, of course, there is overlapping and there is foreshortening. You can see it on the buildings and diminishing size. So those three techniques, overlapping, mainly the human figures against the background or each other, and then there is diminishing size, as you see scenes where there's a distance depicted. And there is foreshortening on some of the optics that they're, you know, uh, marching past. So all three techniques. Uh, the modeling is, of course, necessary for this. It's a bas relief figure. Remember, without uh, modeling, we could not see without the shadows from the sun, uh, the figures, the details of any bas relief. So it, it is a technique here. It's used to create the outlines of the figures. But they are done with carved line, of course, not painted. All the lines here are carved. And those create really good simulated texture. Let's go up close and you'll see it on the armor. See, look at these, they're talking to each other. They're probably wondering what's gonna happen to them that day. Or, you know, who are these Dacians? What are we gonna, well, they might've met some of them perhaps, 
in any case, you see the detail is done very realistically on the faces, the clothing, the armor, and even the buildings in the background and the hair, right? All of it, very realistic. Uh, and that's typical of Roman <clears throat> sculpture and poverty panels. Then there's the rhythm of the, of course, all the human bodies, their heads, their, their, their arms and legs, the shields, um, even the armor, and then the buildings behind them. Uh, so a lot of rhythm, but it's, it's hard to say which it is more stable or more dynamic. Obviously, this is supposed to be water, like a wave, like he just, you know, jumped up out of you know, a river and the water just crested over his head. That's what that, it's not a jump rope. That's what one of my students thought it was. Uh, this is not him playing some kind of game. Th th that, of course, is dynamic. And the arches on some, but not most of the buildings are pretty stable. The background's mostly stable. And this panel is mostly stable. The, the soldiers are marching mostly upright. So I'd say the majority of the bottom panel is stable. Uh, and then this panel is a mixture. This side off to the left, mostly stable. And these two soldiers, but then the rest that are building the walls or the siege towers behind them are in motion. So it's a mixture in the, you don't have to describe the, these two panels. It's all you can see clearly here. Color is a cool off gray, right? Uh, and there's no warm color. If you think that's something from the original, that's just discoloration from the weather. It's been sitting out in the open air for 1900 plus years, of course. Um, and then the largest mass, that's hard to say. I'd say in this panel, it's probably Neptune because these are separate buildings. And then, or unless you count the pontoon bridge here or boats side by side. But even then, I'd say it's probably Neptune. Then maybe the bridge, just can say bridge if you want, or boats. They're so close, they look like a single mass. And, and then the soldiers are all about the same, about equal. Whereas up here, you have these two soldiers, they're probably officers that are directing their men to build this uh, attack structure. It's called a siege tower behind them. In any case, these two soldiers, their soldiers, are the largest here. Or you could say the walls behind them, I guess, and then them. And then after that, it's, it's probably close. Call the rest, the rest of the figures are almost all the same size. OK, and, um, and then we have, let's see, balance. Yes, each panel is, is pretty carefully balanced. It's true there's so many figures here, and there's no human figures here, but they're buildings that fill in the space to the top of the, of the uh, panel, pretty much all the way in each of the layers, or levels, I meant to say. So I'd say it's balanced left to right and top to bottom within each panel or each section. OK, well, we did pretty well, so now I will take questions. Is if anybody joined us late, um, I, I took, uh, I mean, yeah, gave people the time to ask questions about your papers because they are due. If you don't want them to be counted late, you haven't turned them in by midnight tonight. So if you don't want a few points off, try to get them in before midnight as a member PDF only and to Mark W at AOL with the title of, uh, you know, I already said it, so I'm not going to hold it up to the screen again because we're we're down to the end of the evening here. But art, uh, one point one short paper number one, and then underline last name, comma first name, and only to Mark W at AOL because they won't get uh, logged in properly if they go to my Outlook account because it's it's more difficult to navigate to me. All right, anybody else have any questions about anything we covered tonight, or about your papers or extra credit? or Roman art or anything else like that. Okay, nobody else has any questions, correct? Oh, all right. Well, you guys, uh, good luck. I'll, I'll look forward to seeing all your papers or most of you. And if you need more time, that's okay. Don't forget if you if you have a, a legitimate uh, a medical or family emergency and written evidence of it, you get an extra week. But I have to see the written evidence, not my rule, that's the college's rule. And uh, that requires me to see a screenshot of, a, you know, a doctor's note or something like that, or prescription or, or some evidence of some kind of, um, you know, like a plane ticket or something, or family, you know, emergency, uh, it could be several things. Uh, and that just needs to be sent to me, of course, as a, a document or as a, you know, an attachment of some kind, um, PDF format if possible. And you need to accompany it with an explanation and then you get an extra week if you need it with no points off. Okay, all right, I'll see you guys next week.
Good night, everybody. Thanks, Professor. Thank yeah, you. Thank See you. It. Take care. Yeah, have a good week. Stay safe. Did I answer everybody's questions? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Right. Oh, I meant to turn off that.